Welcome to The Prisoner's Dilemma, the show where we watch and talk about the 1960s TV show, The Prisoner. I'm Brendan, and with me is my hollow suit of a political opponent, Matthew. Uh, America, I've come to you today to be elected president of America, I think. What promises will you make to your constituency? Uh, I promise to manipulate you more. <laughs> but how do you feel about life and death? Um, hmm, how do I feel about life and death? I don't know, but I think a screaming white circle would probably help answer that question. Also joining us, the reporter with her finger to the heartbeat of the people, Carla <laughs> Zamonja. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am excited to be here with also uh, as 114 and my uh, photographer 114B uh, sharing a number for some fucking reason. There's so much number sharing in this episode. Carla, just off the dome, who would you vote for, me or Matthew? <laughs> Whoa. Um, it seems unfair. Well, you two know sham, each other already. That's true. I mean, you have to admit it's not the most meaningful election. No. I think I would I would vote for whichever of you was already going to win and thus curry favor. There uh, you go. Wise. Everyone I votes mean, for a dictator. If we follow yes. the episode, the one non-guy in the room is going to be the next winner. So that's you. Congrats. Mm, yay. Carla, <laughs> yeah. uh, what is, what's your history with The Prisoner? Um, so let's see. My dad showed it to me when I was uh, a child. Uh, so I didn't uh, didn't all by myself find a uh, 1968 or uh, show uh, in the <laughs> 80s. Um, but yeah, my, my dad showed it to me. He loved it. And we still quote it to each other and like that. Um, it's a good time. And yeah. I think it, me- it meant a lot to him. He was very... Uh, he. He was an artistic, like, Mm -hmm. young man and child, Mm -hmm. and then he ended up going to military school and becoming a lawyer. So I think there are some themes there (laughs) that (laughs) may have resonated with him. Uh, And also, who doesn't love a, like, specifically mannered British depiction of these themes? They're so good at it. You know what? Um, No matter what, I'm always going to get those excellent, excellent... Uh, sarcastic manners at work. Mm. Hell yeah. There's, Have either um, of you seen uh, the YouTube video? This is great for an audio only medium uh, oh, from Jess yeah. Erskine, where like she and her dad remake the prisoner intro. No, oh my God. I've just no, but linked I wanna, it. I need to, I will look at it later and I'm excited. It's it sounds so, so good. <laughs> lovely. It's so lovely. Uh, it's a very, it just reminds me a lot of that story. Carla. <laughs> just like <laughs> people who clearly love, Love the prisoner, intergenerational love of this show. It's great. As I am rewatching the show for this show, I have been watching it with my mom, who has never seen it before. Aww. And she's like, That's so good. This is a very prescient su- show. And she's right. Yeah. She's, she's right. Yeah. Have your, the, <laughs> Brennan's mom, get on the podcast. You know what? Hell yeah. We'll see what I we mean, can do. yes. Uh, perhaps none so prescient as this week's episode Free for All. <laughs> Yeah. What, a, what a weird little episode we've got here. God, for real. <laughs> we have entered the metaphor zone. We have. Mm-hmm. We really, really, and mm-hmm. truly have. Before we even get to the summary on this thing, let's call out. Who wrote this episode? Um, I have here in my oh. notes, I think it would be a Patty Fink. <laughs> <laughs> no, Patty Fink is the Bluff Almost. City character. <laughs> uh, Patty Fitz. Sorry, Patty we got close. <laughs> and you know, you know who that is, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's Patrick McGowan. Of course. It's Patrick Using McGowan. Using one of his cute little aliases. Yeah. yeah. This is, Fitz he's... after his mother, Rose Fitzpatrick. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. So, assumably, this is one of the original seven. I think we can pretty much guarantee, lock in. Absolutely. I believe it was actually the second one ever produced, and there's a lot of stuff in the show that points to that. I've gestured before about, like the turbulent order of these things sometimes causing mm-hmm. problems. I think this is going to be mm-hmm. a prime example of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to wait a little bit before I introduce this, but I'd like to introduce my personal uh, game that I'm playing in this episode. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. Hell yeah. Um, I believe this is the second episode chronologically. Oh, why so? Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. We're, this oh. is the game we're going to play. Okay. I'm okay. introducing you to the game right now. Sure. As All we right. move through this episode, I will re- reveal why I think that. Is there anything that you can share about the meta of this game to ensure that I win and you lose? 
Yes. <laughs> um, if we get to the end of the episode mm-hmm. and you can't see my reading, I lose and I have to uh, go through some sort of like ritual removal from the community. Do I you think. have to go through the Metal Gear Solid 4 microwave hallway like Patrick McGoo does? I think that might be it. Yeah, <laughs> I think there is a microwave hallway. It's just downstairs in this little bunker that we're set up in. It's so convenient um, that the elevator just goes straight there. Yeah, 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 yeah. After you get kind of like bombarded with a blue light, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, McGoohan wrote and directed this episode. And by his own uh, estimation, it is his favorite episode of The Prisoner. Yeah. It's also really interesting, especially. (laughs) Sorry, Carla. (laughs) No, I just said sure. (laughs) I think it's a good. So, well, okay, we'll we'll get into it. But um, yeah, sure. we'll get to it. It's it's really interesting when you look at script differences in terms of like the filming script differences. Ooh. Because typically, right, if you're looking at those, you can say, okay, well, maybe Patrick on the day of, or maybe the director, like, was saying, hey, we should make these changes to the script. But in this case, we know for sure that any variations off the script was something that Patrick McGowan in the moment of filming was like, no, 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 it's got to be this way. Totally. Yep. Did you find a lot of discrepancy? Oh, yeah. We'll get to it. (laughs) Okay. Sorry, I didn't want to become like the Kool-Aid man there for a second. No, that was a pitch perfect uh, Kool-Aid man. You've been hiding that under a bushel. (laughs) (laughs) Um, With that. Kind of Randy Savage. Yeah, well. I I I also thought. And Matthew, could you please do number six as Randy Savage? (laughs) (laughs) Mm, Where am I, brother? In the village. Mm, what do you want? Information. Mm, whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 Mm, you won't get it, brother. <laughs> by hook or by crook, we will. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the indulgence. Yeah, yeah, that is oh, a God. Catholic Church indulgence because of that. Brennan will go to heaven, so Thank congratulations, God. everyone. This, He's uh, done his penance. The whole project of the prisoner's <laughs> dilemma has come through. Brennan has confirmed a seat in yep. the heavenly choir. That's the end of the show. Thank Thanks, everyone. Finally. Matthew, if you've still got a throat, would you please tell us what happens in Free For All? You betcha. Over yet another tense breakfast with yet another number two, number six learns of an upcoming village election, which will supposedly democratically elect the next number two. We also meet number 58, a new arrival who speaks a made-up, in and out of fiction, Eastern European language. Number six does not actually agree to run, but gives a short campaign speech anyway. The next day, he is taken by number 56 to the local assembly chambers, in which number two And he verbally spar while a strange throne with a blue glowing eye looks on. Deciding number six is riling up the assembly too much, number two has him brainwashed by a new number 26. The brainwashing lasts for about one and a half scenes of campaigning before number six comes to his senses and makes a break for it. He is captured and brainwashed a second time, this time by the lamp above his bed. This one lasts until number six has a breakdown in the village pub, which leads to number 58, ferrying him to a secret bar where he meets number two. Number six is shortly brainwashed a third time. This one lasts him through to the end of the election, which he wins handily. The former number two lets six into the number two office along with number 58. After a bit of messing around, number 58 starts slapping number six. Brought to his senses, number six attempts to convince all the villagers to escape. This leads to nothing except two men coming to beat him up. After what is supposed to be a brutal beatdown in a cave near a rover cult, number six is dragged back to number 58 and the reveal that she is the new number two. (gasps) And this was all a ruse to break him. The new and old number two exchange a goodbye and a give my regards to the homeland before the typical end credits. Ah, the homeland. How we always talk about <laughs> the place that we're from. Yeah, normally. The normal place stuff. that we're both from that I don't need to mention the name of. Yeah, Why would yeah, I mention yeah. it? Absolutely not. We already know. What do we think of this episode? Is this good? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is beyond good or bad. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think it's very fun. Mm-hmm. It's scattered as hell, honestly, but mm-hmm. like, God, it's a good time. <laughs> It has a lot of great ideas. That is true. That is also what my dad says about Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This... Sorry, I just started thinking just... about Zardoz. 
<laughs> Understandable. <laughs> this is an episode that is like dense with layers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it is not a good narrative. <laughs> yeah. It is not necessarily a good parable <laughs> or allegory or yeah. metaphor, but it is dense. It is an object of fascination. And I think that if you didn't have episode four, Free For All, the prisoner would not be the thing that it is today, right? You need something like this that people can like really chew on for literal decades, right? And we're going to do like what a two hour podcast in which we're going to fully reveal all of it. So, you know, good on us. Sure. Yeah. We'll, Sweet. we'll finally have the, the final word on it. Um, no, I agree. I think that it is, it's an entertaining watch and it feels in many ways, like the first draft of what this <laughs> idea ought to be. Um, you know, I think yeah. I, I mentioned earlier that this is the second episode in the production. And I think you can feel that in terms of how characters are put together, how scenes move from one place to the other, how characters are rendered, even taking aside like the timeline questions. But I also agree that this is where the show really begins to get peculiar in a way above and beyond <laughs> A, B and C. A, B and C had you know, inception dream manipulation stuff. Yeah. But also a great time. Absolutely. A, a very, very fun episode, but this really starts to like pick at what it means to be a person and what other people are willing to do to you in order to try and get you to not be a person. Yeah. It, it lends the show this like deep surreality, surreality, right? Like, we talked a bit about in the very first episode about how Rover is this like vector of unreality in the show. Right. Hmm. Um, and this episode really uh, highlights that and like extends it into this prolonged dreamlike narrative sequence. There's some really choice hmm. Rover bits in this. Uh, uh -huh. There are. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were more in the script. Oh, really? Yeah, we'll get oh, to it as loss. we go through. I yeah. want to get through it chronologically. Yeah, let's talk about the beginning then. Let's talk about number two showing up on my man's TV. Well, so, first, one of the most delightful things that happens even before that is the announcement, um, the the morning wake up um, <laughs> call over the radio, mm -hmm. which which quote unquote says, "Congratulations on another day." Yeah, and I was it. just like, "What a fucking like, <laughs> what an intro! What a what a ball to kick in your face the minute uh -huh. this episode opens is just like, congratulations on another day. Yeah, you're still alive. You're still here. Mm. You're making it through. Great. And yeah, tomorrow you can wake up and cut trees again. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, big affirmations. Uh, what a, yeah, God, cut trees somehow with with a stone axe. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, with your Minecraft axe. Yeah. Um, well, also the, you know, when you cut it, it's way bigger than when it was a tree. And a different oh, tree. Happened. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's, 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 yeah that's movie magic. <laughs> that is movie magic. That's yeah. the village's magic. Mm -hmm. That's um, true. The other, another game that I'm playing, by the way, sorry, I'm revealing now there was a second game. I'm a man of lies. Um, yeah, there's so many games. The second game that I'm playing this episode is what of this is Magecraft and what of this <laughs> is Stagecraft. Do you like that? It's like a quiz show. Uh, can you like can you like elucidate what you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. So um to what extent are we expecting that the things that happen this episode are super science, right? Functionally magic. Right. And mm. to what extent are the things we're happening in this episode stagecraft or like stage magician work, where it's all about like sure. fooling, playing with timing and expectation? The sure. prisoner is always real fast and loose with both of those things. Uh, I think in this episode more than any other. Yeah. Um so far. Uh we'll get there. Totally. Anyway, um, so this number two, we already gestured. He shows up uh, on the, well, first of all, there's a call. Fenella Fielding, mm -hmm. our beautiful Isabel is back. Um, she confirms Thank that goodness. number six is there, which is going to be important for the reveal they're about to do on him. Right. right? Um, right. And uh, number six is so angry. Did y'all note this? Yeah. He's oh, very him angry? Weird. <laughs> but, I've never seen that before. <laughs> but he hasn't been this angry since episode one. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, episodes... what a coincidence that this was the second one shot. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, almost it, like it's the second chronologically as well. Weird. Yeah. It certainly doesn't make, like, when you think back to A, B, and C, like, this doesn't follow it well. Like, it doesn't no. make it, it, there's no connectivity there or, no. like, it, or, like, evolution, you know, of anything. It's, it's weird, yeah. 
or, or even the sort of coy game playing that he's doing in Chimes of Big Ben, where he is at least like going out into the village and playing chess or going to number right. two's place for right. breakfast, that kind of thing. Here he is like, do not call me. Leave me alone. I'm going to escape right. the hell with all yeah. of you. Well, it should be pointed out also that doing those normal everyday, like kind of playing along things are in fact spycraft. Sure. And he kind of dumps that idea. He does, yeah. In this one, like out the side. He's just like, we're not doing any of that. Well, so I think that this starts making sense if this is the second chronological episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because if this is the second chronological episode and it was the second one produced, you can think about Patrick McGowan in the head of number six, right? Sort of embodying this guy. I think that we can read a lot of the sort of more playful number six we see later um, as a deeply traumatized man. Mm -hmm. uh, this is self-defense of I'm going to sort of play along but at a distance, right? And I think that you're totally right. A, B, and C does not, you know, naturally link up with them in that way. But if we go the other way around, right, if, if this – if A, B, and C happened first chronologically, we could imagine number six like – rushing up to confront number two, right? Uh, or to when he sees mm -hmm. the scientist lady, like run up to her in anger, demanding something, getting physically violent, like we see him in episodes one and this one, right? But he's not, he's been cowed. They've successfully managed in this episode to torture it out of him, which is really sad, I think. Um, more on that reading as we move forward. Um, but number two, let's talk about number two real quick. Let's do it. Uh, this is Eric Portman. Uh, he's a stage and film actor. Um, mm -hmm. Notably, he'd been in a bunch of like detective and spy thrillers, nothing that has like retained popularity to the modern day. But I think you can see a lot of that in terms of the way that he's interacting. Um, Brendan, you already described him showing up on the TV. Can you describe the sequence a little bit for us? Absolutely. So again, uh, Six gets a call. Vanilla Fielding asks him uh, if it's number six. Number six <laughs> confirms only that this is Residence number six, he refuses mm -hmm. to assert himself as number six. Once once the call is connected, number two appears on the TV and this mm -hmm. audio seems to come from the TV. Uh, mm -hmm. Pointedly, he asks, hello, any complaints? Uh, <laughs> yes. Number, number six tells him, you know, hell if you get out of here. I, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a really, really good exchange. Number two asks if he'll uh, uh, receive him. Um, mm -hmm. Number six says the mountain can come to Muhammad. Uh, which leads this great back and forth as it reveals oh, that so good. despite the footage of number two being in the control room or his headquarters mm -hmm. very, very clearly is in fact right outside the door. Right. So this is my first, their first instance of my game. Do we think that he was really just in the control room and they use some sort of like teleportation device to get him outside the door? Do we think that, you know, it's just an allegory, who cares? Or do we think this is all stagecraft? Do you think that part of having Fenella Fielding call number six was to set up, oh, you're there, so now we can use the pre-recorded thing, yeah. even though number two's right outside, and it's all, you know, magician stagecraft? I would guess that, personally. Yeah. Because that was, it was not a long exchange. No. Um, <clears throat> it was just like, yeah, it was like... Um, any complaints, he gave a complaint, and then he kind of evaded, because, well, because... Uh, Patrick, Patrick McGowan said, like, um, I'd like to mind my own business mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. like so that. And, like, you know, there was just sort of, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like, that. that is a response, a direct response, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not sure how they could have done that. But I mean, you could imagine, right, you could record lots and lots of little bits, of, <laughs> even with 1960s technology, right? That's true. You could record lots and lots of little bits, and then you have an operator just, like, pressing yes. which, which number two screen are we uh, going to next, Mechanical Turk right? of some kind. <laughs> yeah, like literally everything in this show, there is always a person operating a thing. Right. Like occasionally right. there is like something that is truly mechanical, but it's like loud and worrying. And like, you know, usually you have to be like, call up some guy and be like, hey, this corridor of the perimeter needs looking at. OK, thank you. Right. And like, you know, it's everything is so human mediated mm -hmm. that like I would not put it past them to have yeah something like that where they're just using a keyboard with fucking samples <laughs> from... <laughs> Number two. I think put one in the stagecraft category. I agree. All right. Yeah. We'll keep track as we go through. Spectacular. Uh, um, so then they have breakfast. Well, there's a really... <laughs> sure do. The, as soon oh, as yeah. the door opens, I really just want to call out this exchange because it's so... It's so good. It's, it's good writing, but it also really establishes what the, sh what the episode is trying to do, at least in terms of the script. Um, sure. Whether or not it succeeds in that, we will determine, <laughs> but this is what it's trying to do. Um, 
he walks in uh, or he knocks on the door and the door opens and says, Muhammad, uh, replying to the the mountain can come to Muhammad. Number six right. says Everest, I presume. Exactly. I've never had a head for heights. Head for heights. Oh, do you have it? No, no, I'm, I'm remembering it. I, can, I only wrote down my favorite line, which I think is the next one, where six goes, where's number one? And number two says, at the summit. At the summit. Mm. And I was like, ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> that's just, that's beautiful. Like, yeah. That's, a, that's um, possibly the cleverest line in this episode. Um, um, it's very, very good. And then it's followed really, really well by uh, number six, sort of softening a tiny bit and asking, play it according to Hoyle? Mm-hmm. Which is an old-fashioned expression referring to to play something sort of by the rules. By exactly. the right, it's, it's card game rules, yeah. like yeah. officially, yeah. but like colloquially, yeah. Referring to Edmund Hoyle, who's like this uh, noted writer of different card game rules. He wrote right. a short treatise on the game of whist, which I'm sure uh, all Acorn oh, fans have probably read. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Good old whist, exactly. Uh, and then number two says all cards on the table. Um, he's right. basically entreating number six, like, Hey, here's a game that you are going to play. And I really want you to play along with, I'm going to expel out exactly what the rules are. And if you agree to right. play by the rules that are set out, good things can come of it. Whether or not that happens. Or Wait, not. you're saying you're saying they're setting up games in this episode. That's true. Weird. Hold on. That's so strange. It's almost like that's a callback to earlier in the episode. Hmm, um, Weird. Um, the other thing that's interesting is Edmund Hoyle, uh, sorry, to, to sort of, as they're talking about here, right, to say that they're uh, played according to Hoyle. It does mean played by the rules, but it also suggests a punitive authority. Right. right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So it suggests somebody is going to enforce these rules. And if you mm-hmm. don't play by the rules, there will be punishment. Exactly. Um, so yes, you're totally right. They have this lovely little Gilmore Girls esque back and forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's delightful. It's good. It's fun stuff. Uh, Patrick McGowan, or I'm sorry, Patty Fink. Nope, that's oh. uh, <laughs> definitely could uh, you know Completely write some clever stuff. Yeah. The, yeah. These these two are not uh, these two are not boyfriends. These are mean girls. No, no, no. They are mean girls it's for true. sure. And then we get into yet another classic number two breakfast toast. Uh, Toast, French toast. International. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, don't make that mistake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is also the first time that we're seeing the um, the quote-unquote new number two pin here. Yeah. Uh, right, this big black frilly thing that number oh, two uh, has pinned to his lapel. Oh, the the campaign pin. It's uh, his, is, his is white. Right, yeah. his is white, though. Um, uh, but yes. Was it? Yes, it was. Sixes is black. Like, almost like. Almost, almost like. like we're choosing chest size uh, or something. Exactly, yes. Remarkable. 100%. Yeah, who goes first? Yeah, it's like John Locke says in Lost, exactly. it's good and evil. You're yeah. totally right. It was it was white. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. He doesn't have his regular pin on. So for he does. Uh, oh, it's he on did, the other yeah. side underneath his scarf. <laughs> what a rude guy. I'm sorry. Welcome to the prison. It's fine. This is my co-host, Carlos Manja. Uh, I've been kicked Matthew, off. Matthew, you've been voted out. <laughs> I've lost the election. Oh, oh no! Man. And according to the rules, you'll now be publicly executed. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So next up, we get number 58 arriving for the first time because she brings in the breakfast, right? Yes. Tell me about number 58. She has a photographic memory, supposedly, even though it never comes to anything. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Uh, well, I, I think that the photographic memory is the explanation for why she's here, right? Yeah. Because she worked in records is the quote we get. Mm-hmm. So the mm-hmm. idea is that she saw a whole bunch of like secret stuff that mm-hmm. she shouldn't have. And now, she, you know, like everybody else in the village who is a villager, or the information in her head has to be protected. Right. I thought I thought there was some sort of implication by number two that that that, that was part of her use. Um, but here it does not seem that she's well, really using it. I mean, he says specifically she won't be here long or she shouldn't oh. be here long. Right? So I think oh, the idea is hmm. that she's playing ball with them, right? I see. She's revealing all the secrets from her, you know, perfect memory or whatever. Mm. I see. And therefore will not be here for particularly long. I see. So it's just the excuse. It's just the excuse, I think. Yeah. Um, so number 58. I feel like I wanted it to play into it, but yeah. <laughs> this is not that kind of episode. If you want nope, details, it's, ex- it's shown earlier to play off later in narrative beats. Not here. No, not, for yeah. you. not this one. Not this one. Yeah. No. Um, so this is Rachel Herbert. Uh, and she was a TV actress and basically a bunch of spy and detective thrillers, notably also Danger Man. Right. Mm. Oh. Um it's interesting. We had a little bit of a break from like super danger manny casts, and we are now back to like 
Danger Man casts, for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. Which makes sense because it's the second episode in production, right? You're going to grab a lot of the people that you, like, know personally, right, that you've worked with before. Mm-hmm. Um, she's speaking... <laughs> Gobbledygook? <laughs> I would charitably call it. Just, like... Uh. But it's, like, Eastern European-flavored gobbledygook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, it's, yeah, yeah. they're clearly going for, like, you know, Polish or... Uh huh. Like vaguely Russian style, but like. Uh huh. It, it feels so, very much like they are trying to invent a Slavic language. Yes. yes. That is close enough to the real thing that both we and Number Six are feel too awkward about not identifying, and so aren't going to bring it up. Except then later, Number Six displays familiarity with it enough to say something to her. Yeah. What's yes. up with that? I don't know. (laughs) Let's get to it in sequence. Sure. The thing that I do think is interesting is that I do think it's it's intentional here. Mm -hmm. So Patrick McGowan wrote this out phonetically in the script. Oh. Mm. Uh, Right. So he wrote "Ali Mukat Taitin na Yakput East Zorbort," which they just read out. I think I heard that. uh, I think the guard in the start of uh, Riven said that to me when he took my journal. Yeah, that's true. I was going to say, I think that was in a Stanislaw Lem book. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, wow, amazing. So so I think that we can, at this point, we don't have a lot of to go on here, but I think we can read some intentionality in terms of, like, the specific noises that Patrick McGuin wants them to be playing Mm -hmm. with, at least. Um, This this first bit is not too important until we get to, we've already talked about, like, number 58 being there, until we get to the election, Mm -hmm. right? So there's this big, like, brass band, uh, marching band sort of thing going down the street. Uh, there's a big parade, right? Uh, you know how in election season we do parades all the time? Oh, yeah. Uh, just constantly in, down major streets. Maybe in the 60s in the UK. I'm just trying to be charitable. <laughs> this, um, this is another <laughs> bit of that stagecraft where uh, – or I, I'm asserting that it's stagecraft where number two there. has come to number six's place to broach the subject of – Hey, there are elections. It'd be a great idea if you came along uh, for the ride. Mm-hmm. And before it, it, he's barely even uh, brought up the subject before he re- reveals that actually there's a campaign going on <laughs> immediately Rally, outside yeah. his door. In yeah. full fucking swing. Yeah. 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 I think this one's for sure a strange craft. There, I don't think there's any, any yeah. super, super science going on in this moment. No. Mm-hmm. They're able to move people around the village however they want. Like there's no. I mean, we saw this in episode one, there. right? Where they like completely get everybody oh, yeah. to like not be in number six's way until right. the particular moment that they want them to reveal themselves again. Right. I guess the um, the the little bit of question bit. It, actually, in this one they had. Well, this is a little later, but in this one they had some. They had the cue cards, which was very interesting <laughs> because, like previously, I feel like whenever we see people acting as one, mm. there's no apparent, uh, you know, Control. communication vector for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fact, like that. That's what makes it a little bit like what just happened there when they like Do completely anyway. fall silent in in uh, all at once you know Later in, on, on yeah. mass etc um but like whenever they do anything whenever it's kind of like okay time to go and they all seem to know how to go without any apparent cue and things like that um there yeah th- there's a very um mechanical nature to the crowds in this one there where is they're not only doing things on cue but they are shouting and chanting and marching utterly mirth- mirthlessly when they are laughing they are laughing because they are told to laugh and everything yep. else yes. they are just shouting in monotone they're not cheering they're not happy yeah. for one candidate or angry at the other it is just noise 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 they seem to get a little happier later when number six starts promising them things but then yeah mm-hmm. but like uh, and I keep skipping forward because I keep okay. no, you're good. threads. I'm That's sorry. Don't worry about um, it. But then notably when um, the election is done, there is no response from anyone. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that is because <laughs> nobody bothered to tell them, I guess, what to do or um, question mark. This crowd is dressed up in the like rainbow. The Yeah. The primary color stripes stuff yeah. that we have yeah. seen. They're using their umbrellas as if they're like bayonets to salute and stuff like that. I wanted to call one thing out that I noticed in the crowd as they are marching away from number six's place. I'm going to share this picture <laughs> in the Discord. Exciting. We've never done this before. Nope. This, I love this. This is the wrong Discord. Never mind. I'm going to send it to somewhere else. Um, I have to share <laughs> it from my phone it. because I couldn't screenshot it from YouTube. <laughs> oh, of course not. Yeah. Okay. There um, it is. 
Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> so there's two notable bits of eyewear here. Oh, yes, yes, the 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 ska uh glasses yeah. and the and the Inuit ones. Yeah, yeah. so there's both totally. this Inuit like snow blind the, the slit. Yeah, the yeah. slit uh protection. Those things are great. Which this is not the only time that we will see this eye covering in the show, so that's interesting. They'll um, come up much more importantly later. And fact. then in the middle of this crowd is someone just wearing this checkerboard pattern pair of sunglasses mm-hmm. as if they're yeah. like part of the mod scene or something like that. It's so yeah. they're glasses. Are they sky Prescient. glasses? No, yeah. they're not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know as but much about Scott. Funny so to I, say. I, was, I was willing to acquiesce the, the, the authority no. here. No, the the check, checkerboard sort of a ska thing, yeah. but like it's oh. it, it, I have no, you know. That's not a real. What if some crowd was playing ska instead? Shit, yeah. Just the butler going like, "Pick it up." Uh, anyway, <laughs> that would be world. great. That would be great. So we, we we're skipping around a bit, but just to get before we get into like the fullness of the rally, you know, mm-hmm. number two, as we've gestured at, comes here to try to get number six to run. Um, and the big promise he makes is that if he wins, number one will no longer be a mystery to you. Right. Yeah. Right. right. He says he'll make an introduction or something like that. Um, well, he doesn't. Actually, he, he, oh, he does comes, he not? I no, thought, no. What he wait, says wait, wait, is where that is it? he said he prom- promised an introduction. I thought maybe he he he, he, hmm. he says it about a different thing. He says, if no. you know what I mean. It, so he, directly after that, he says, if you know what I mean. Anyway, so let me just read the whole thing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Should you win, number one will no longer be a mystery to you, he laughs, if you know what I mean. Anyway, let me introduce you properly and see how you feel when you've had a chance to assess the maddening crowd. He's talking about the crowd he's going to introduce He's talking about the crowd. Oh, shit. He misdirected. All right. I love that. Yeah. That's great. He says also of the crowd, they think it's a game. Hmm. Games. Weird. Weird. I don't know why they would think that. Hmm. There's also a telling bit here where – Number six asks, so what happens if I win? Number two says, you're the boss. And number six (laughs) says, number one's the boss. Yeah, so let's just really quickly remember back in, you know, episode two, uh, where we have our beautiful boy, Leo McKern, saying, is that an order number six? Right, exactly. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more on that subject, but I'm just drawing a line in red thread between two moments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway. Perfection. um, then we get this great rally, right? Um, it's on the steps to number two's like little office place. It's that same place where in episode one we see Waldo get uh, run out, run away and murdered by Rover, if you remember. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And this nice big open area. We have the crowd in front. Um, you were already mentioning, Carla, how we have uh, the butler who's beneath number six and number two, so they can't see him. But we get to see him bringing up cue cards to tell the right. cu- crowd how to react to stuff. Raw. Which is phenomenal. so good. Raw. It's progress, so good. progress, 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 and progress, which is such a weird thing to mm-hmm. have a crowd chant. It's great. It's very good. Well, uh, we know that Patrick McGowan cares a lot about progress as a concept, mm. right? He's oh. a, I mean, um, so we brought up in some prior episodes, right, about how a lot of the iconography in the show is about Patrick McGowan's sort of anxieties around society moving too fast. Mm-hmm. Okay, right? okay. A progress being a negative, things that we would consider to be fairly, you know, conservative talking points these days, mm-hmm. right? But like okay. the penny farthing locked in place, right, mm-hmm. is like an example of like playing with this sort of tension around progress or being held in place. Right. All of the like super science we see, right, is from enemies. Only That's enemies true. have access to this like highest level of technology, mm-hmm. right? And I suppose Rover is probably the most like, yeah terrifying piece of unknowable technology that we have seen so when far. you consider it that way yeah in this episode we got some choice ones yeah. um what i thought was also really interesting is we have all of these guys in like black top hats and standing behind yeah. number two and number six here they look exactly like the guy in the opening sequence who like say, gasses number six the gas guy yeah yeah and they've got just some some gas dudes um, <laughs> just around <laughs> just that around was, that was that was one of the um one of my examples for like weirdly for a show that is worried about progress so much of the control is exerted like by literal humans yeah. like there's phones and stuff but like i mean i i guess you know using a cordless phone to call <laughs> a guy to 
you know, go pick up number six is mm-hmm. also scary, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like literally right from the beginning, like, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like a machine is placed at, on his keyhole and like sure. a switch flipped and the dude runs away. He literally like puts the hose on it and stands there as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. Like it is a guy performing the action. It's, you know, it's not like something that was rigged up in his house that he closes the door and it just does it. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, it's nothing like, it's just like even the the fucking banality of evil, you know, basically, where like a human has to execute all these things. Sure. Uh, no matter how um, dastardly. So it's kind of, I, I feel like there's, there's um like you bring up the, the progress concept and I, it's kind of like, I think that there's tension there. I think you're right. Mm. Um, but I think there's tension there between like, Technology is allowing these, you know, banal, shitty functionaries to do to be worse or something of the that nature. I could see that being sort of a totally, a point. yeah. I, I I very consciously brought up the Mechanical Turk er, earlier, right? This yeah. idea of like here is a technological wonder, surprise, surprise, yes. that requires a crew of humans behind it in order to make it happen. We have uh, uh, we uh, practically every episode, this one included, have an escape attempt of some kind, and Rover is part of that. But behind Rover is this legion of watch stations, the control station, the people on the seesaw that are watching everything going on. There are so Your many alert guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's so many people that are complicit in that system and that have to work together in order to make sure that this impermeable mesh stays firm. Totally. It's totally true. But it's also notable that there's a great effort put into dehumanizing those people. Yes. Right. It's true. Uh, they are they say roles. simple things. They like, yeah, they behave very predictably. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. They are in many ways part of the machine. Yeah. If you will. But but they're also characters meant to stand in for other things, right? It's like a mm-hmm. like a Punch and Judy show or like, you know, yeah. like a comedy uh, uh comedy del art sort of thing, right? Like these are big Archetypes. stock characters. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Um we get this great scene where uh, number six is invited to address the crowd, right? He's so mad. He's, He's so mad. He hates this. <laughs> he, and he hates the crowd. He hates all of them. In some place, at some time, all of you held positions of a secret nature and had knowledge that was invaluable to an enemy. Like me, you are here to have that knowledge protected or extracted. That's the stuff to give them. Unlike me, many of you have accepted the situation of your imprisonment and will die here like rotten cabbages. Keep going, beloved. The rest of you have gone over to the side of our keepers. Which is which? How many of each? Who's standing beside you now? I intend to discover who are the prisoners and who are the warders. I shall be running for office in this election. (laughs) <laughs> Number two loves does. that he hates them so much. Yeah, yeah. He just leaned over like, oh, yes, you're really giving it to them. Yeah, yeah. I'm loving this. They're eating this up. Mm, good yeah, job. Go off, bitch. God. Uh, yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. Mean girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- what I thought was really interesting here is we get the first call out of Number Six saying that he's going to figure out the difference between the villagers and the wardens. Yes. Which is... Uh, which is a very like interesting idea, and I, I think like I mean it makes sense for him. Then also that idea is totally dropped for the rest of the episode. <laughs> no, no. Well, oh, it's not. It, I, it, for this episode, yes, because he gets mm-hmm. brainwashed for you know yeah ninety percent of the idea like, of it. But it'll like, come back later when he. Oh yeah, but later when he does get control, he that's not what he tries to do. You know, no, so that, sure. that's no, basically because, all, all I'm talking because about. Because a very yeah, scary totally. Eastern European woman is slapping him, and so he yeah, doesn't have the time. But, but, but you know, there's a whole. Fair. Go ahead, Brendan. Go, no, I, I was just going to um, say, yeah, we see in other episodes, even as far mm-hmm. back as episode one, where it's not clear necessarily who is part of the staff and who is a fellow prisoner. Um, there yep. are people within totally. the village that are performing roles, that are doing things. And, you know, as we'll see time and time again, there are people that are put in positions of, oh, this person is a prisoner. Absolutely. Where it turns out they are actually part of the staff. And so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, over and over. Yeah. 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 No, um, for sure. And and there's a there's going to be a whole episode about specifically later on where number six thinks he finds a way to tell the difference mm-hmm. and sort of how that goes. You know, there's an episode where number six plays with that in order to like do battle with a number two. Right? It, this is not a dropped concept. This is something that number mm-hmm. two does care about consistently throughout the show. So this is the first time we're seeing it come up. Right. 
This is also uh, where he says, and- I'm not a number. I am a person for the first time, if we're thinking about this chronologically. Mm-hmm. Hooray. Yeah. He also says that some of them will die here like rotten cabbages. Oh, yes. It's totally Great true. Line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a very weird move the way that he addresses the crowd. It's very like he appears to just be telling them what he sees as the unvarnished truth, mm-hmm. um, either to get, either to, you know, stick it to number two for putting him in this position, <laughs> or because he's hoping for someone to, like, look at him with recognition, right. I guess. Um, but, of course, they're all very blank. Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a bunch of unsurprisingly there's a bunch of fan readings of this episode, right? Mm. Um the the official prisoner companion, which is a book that Brennan and I both have, um mm. is uh I might have it. It's a good one. Um, I should say is, can, it is it's all right. Um it's Magoon, not great. It's not great and <laughs> Magoon himself has said it's not very good. So oh, no. take that for what you will. But but it, it it is an interesting view at like yes. fan work at the time of its produca- uh, production. Totally, mm-hmm. and um, they seem convinced this is like a Greek tragedy. Mm. That like mm-hmm. there's this hubris that number six would like go in front of this crowd and speak mm-hmm. this like truth to them, and it's because of that hubris that he is punished through the rest of the episode. Interesting. Hmm. I don't buy it, but I think it is a potential reading of the scene. Sure. Interesting. Like he like that's the point at which he sets his intention. Exactly. And then, because he didn't need to come with number two, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's been sort of lured with this like fakey fake promise about number one that we already discussed, and then he's been put in front of this crowd. And rather than like refuse any of this, he's like, no, 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 I'm going to go, you know, stand my soapbox and yell at these people. Right? Yeah, it is a weird choice. It's a weird choice <laughs> in like it makes sense for how the character behaves. It's mm-hmm. hard to make that make sense for me to square that with the image of a person who is a spy. Well, okay, so you know we talked about this a little bit in, in our first episode. Mm. Um, we we never know for sure that he was a spy. I right? suppose that's true. We know that he worked within like the security branch of the UK government, but we don't know for sure that he was a spy. Right? This guy could have been in records as well. He could have been a scientist. Um, in fact, that's another very common <laughs> wow. fan reading is that Patrick McGowan's number six is supposed to also have been a scientist who invented hmm. something so awful that like the village wants him. Um, huh. Does do a we'll lot get, of punching for a scientist. He well, does. I, you know, look, I've got a PhD. I've got a black belt. We exist. <laughs> um, wow. Go off, King. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll, get so, your, you'll get your Greek downfall. Yeah, if only one of these days. <laughs> Um, so the end of the sequence, we get another fun little stagecrafty bit here, right? Um, yeah, it turns out they already have po- uh, posters of him. Uh-huh. Yeah, with his fucking file photo. Of course. On, There's only no one less. photo that exists of number six. Yeah. Well, it's hilarious because the the newspaper guy, the photo, the whatever, 114B or whatever the hell his name was, uh, took uh, took pictures of him right there. And, and I was like, surely they'll use that photo. And then they didn't. No. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the crowd reveals they already have posters that say vote for number six in big red letters in front of the big blown up, just like Patrick McGowan headshot we've seen so many times before. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, go off going rah, 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 we all love <laughs> number six, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, after, after number so two good. leaves him, there's this really fun, interesting bit of, or not even that, honestly, as soon as the speech finishes, there's this really frenetic camera work that I think does this mm-hmm. really, really interesting stuff. And there's this moment where number six is basically like carried off by the crowd. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. this, they love to do this. They, they love doing it. You know what it yeah. put, put me in mind of is um, Huxley's brave new world where mm. this, um, you know, you're in this mode that you think you, you, you're trying to operate according to the standards that you have. And then, you're surrounded by people who are honestly just on a completely different valence from you. And they carry you yeah. along with their energy against your yeah. will, um, which mm-hmm. I, I think was really interesting to see. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, and then I think that we can just jump to this next yes. little scene. Um, well, real quick, like, yeah. oh, I think uh, when it comes to the the ready-made number six posters, yeah, please. I don't like to me that that's just dream logic. Like that's not that's kind of like well, you're in it, so of course we have the thing. Like I, to me, like I wouldn't even want sure. to. That's one of those ones where I wouldn't want to come down on either side, whether it was oh, sure, stagecraft sure, sure. or or magic. I just feel like that is straight up like 
you agreed and so we're doing it. Mm-hmm. I suppose it could have been um, number two being like, of course I'll agree. Let's have it ready. Because mm-hmm. like, I, how hard would that be? It wouldn't be that fucking hard. Right. Um, so like, that's pretty straightforward. And but, they set up everything so far, right? This has been a total of what, like 10 minutes? Right. right? Totally. All, all to put him in a particular headspace uh, where he would like do the speech. Mm-hmm. And, and to be clear, right, he never once actually says, yes, I will run. Right. Right. <laughs> right. He, he never he agrees to this. He behaves as if he will sure. at one point. But yeah. Well, th- th- we're coming up to the one instance where he, of his own volition, does something. Yeah, totally. Right. But like, yeah, but that specific, um, that specific thing, like, I think they probably had it ready. I do think that the way it was presented, the posters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the audience was not supposed to make much of it. It felt very like, it was like, of course, that, well, he's in the race now, so he gets a poster. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't feel like that was supposed to be a, a like, wait a minute, how did they know moment. Do you agree or do you not agree? But but to be clear, also like if we take a look, um, the the poster is actually in the scene the whole time. They just have four oh, people. Really? Yes, they just have four That's people great. standing in front of it. I would really like to be the person who's in charge of logistics in the village, whose job it is to make sure that all this is set to like do the performance. The stage manager of yeah, the village. Exactly, yeah, that'd be great. Exactly. Like, and you can't rehearse it, right? You just have to like know got to we've got to get this right we've got to get it right the first time we're never going to do it again yeah if you go to 1042 you can so clearly see there's two posters one behind mm. the other oh yeah that's great i love that but yeah there's no reason to assume that he didn't just plan it i guess well so i, I think we should return to this later we're playing the game i want us to get to the end of the game um but i do think that there's there is an interesting tension here right and i mentioned the very beginning of this recording but I think that the thing that is good about this episode is about how sort of dense it is and like how many different ways this thing can be read. Right. Right. There's lots of facets on this thing to look sure. at it from. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the next day, presumably, or maybe just later that one, but I would guess the next day. Impossible to know. Uh, impossible to know. <laughs> Time is questionable mm-hmm. um, in this episode, especially. But we get a quick call from number two, and he basically says, Hey, come on down to the local assembly. Because all the candidates, a.k.a. you and me, got to do a presentation in the local assembly. Um, number six says, like, hey, why is number 58 waiting outside in one of those little annoying little golf cart trailer things? And he says, well, she's going to drive you around. Uh, and also implies that, like, maybe they'll have sex. Yeah, it's weird. Oh, is that so? He says, "There's a yeah. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, no, please, I Brendan. To, I don't want to describe much. it. <laughs> okay, sorry. I I will take. I, I'll t- carry this cross. Thanks. Um. So okay, let let me find the exact line then. If I'm going to read this, because so, I feel like with with some previous like obvious like forays into like what if you like this lady? What if we could get to you through her? Right. Um. I feel like some of those previous ones were much more obvious. This one I didn't feel it, but maybe I just there's just it. like yeah. one line briefly yeah. suggesting it." Uh, at your disposal uh, so, okay. for the election period and anything else you may desire within reason. Oh. Yes. Yeah. There's also within, in the script more of this. That's within reason. She's I new thought, here. Like, oh, go ahead. She's new here and quite delightfully charming, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Says number two to mm-hmm. number six. They're constantly trying to get this guy to shack up with ladies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's super true, yeah. yeah. Which is like, you know, a very straightforward way of controlling someone. Um, I feel like... I feel like within reason made me go like, oh, that's not what they meant. But maybe that's wrong. Maybe their idea of being outside of reason is much worse. <laughs> I don't think they're good like, people. I, I think they're just saying it's okay to date your secretary if you feel like dating your secretary. That's what they're saying. Yeah. With, within reason. Right. Let's go. Mm. Pour it out for them. Finally, someone for people who want to date their secretary. <laughs> um, there so, are dozens of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So number six tries to talk to her. He mentions he has to go to town hall, right? This is where like the local assembly is going to be. They get in the car and they get attacked. Right. He doesn't feel he, he, yeah, he doesn't feel she Mm. understands him. So he just walks off. Yeah. And then there's a little weird scene with a, like the touchscreen little map. Yes. Yes. Who is this for? (laughs) I don't know. I think it's just establishing that this lady is going to follow him around no matter what. Yeah, just to set the scene a little bit, mm. right? So he walks away. She follows him in the truck, right? All smiles. By the way, the whole time she's all like, ha, 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 ha. I love this. Um, 
And he walks up to this map, which is all these like cool big buttons. It's like an old Disney World map, like where you press a button and like a location lights up so you can find it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's like a museum. Exactly. And so he walks up and like presses the button for like the town hall because I guess at this point he hasn't been because it's the second episode because chronologically. Episode, oh. Fuck. That would explain some things. Mm, I'm going to keep doing this. Um <laughs> And she then, you know, drives up in the car and, like, just starts pressing the buttons like, ha, 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 I love pressing buttons. I'm a simple Polish girl. Um, I love to press buttons. I it, press buttons whenever they're in front of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Women love buttons. <laughs> That's what we're hearing. Uh, anyway, so uh, basically she ends up then figuring out, okay, they want to go to the town hall, right? Yep. And she's going to drive them. And at this point, we get the attack you were gesturing It's at. true. The press. <laughs> The press. The press. He's coming this way! Quick, swing the camera around! I hate the media! One thirteen, and as Carla mentioned, 113B. My <laughs> our first time getting this. My photograph photographing <laughs> assistant associate or uh-huh. something like that. Yes. Not my photographer, my photographing no. associate. It's so Photographic colleague. Photographic, Photographic colleague. colleague number 113B. Uh, also, this guy has a great voice, great presentation. Mm-hmm. Just, oh, hello, yes. And, and I'm a journalist. And, but you see, I, I was terribly excited. Mm-hmm. Um, number six, this, by the him. way. Oh, understandable. Obviously. This is Harold Behrens. Um, great he's name. a comedian character actor, which I think you can tell from this, right? Because it's, yes. it's a genuinely funny scene, I think, at least. Yeah. Um, he was in a bunch of comedies, notably The Trial of the Pink Panther, right? Mm. Um, uh, Dean or Denny Cooper is the photographer here. This is his only credit, so he was never in anything else, um, which I think is understandable in a minute, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, what do you all think <laughs> of this scene? I thought it was very funny. Oh, it's so fun. I love the I, I love the being completely open about being like, I'm going to ask you some questions and mm-hmm. write down whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. And like, what a good time. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun. Yeah. And the truly weird wind up question. Good stuff. How are you going to handle your campaign? No comment. Intends to fight for freedom at all Smiles. costs. How about your internal policy? No comment. We'll tighten up on village security. Smile! How about your external policy? No comment. Our exports will operate in every corner of the globe. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. Exports? Yeah, I also, I wrote that down. I was like, you have exports? Excuse me? I mean, we've seen two exports so far, right? What do they export? They export people. Yes. Cobb in the first episode, right? Mm -hmm. I can't wait to serve my new masters. No, that's true. They produce broken spies or spies that have gone over to their side and then Malleable rent them spies. out, right? Mm-hmm. From what yeah. we've seen. Yeah, uh, that's fair. I have a different reading of this and I'll talk about sure. it later. Oh, okay. Fair. Yeah. What? Why later? Because okay, it, because the, someone says something later on that provides that, that detail. Ah. Yeah. And then finally, this thing you were gesturing at, Carla, how do you feel <laughs> about life and death? God, which, I to love which, that. <laughs> The prisoner says, mind your own business. And the reporter says, no comment. No comment. It's this beautiful little, like, rule so of good. thirds comedy bit. It's so good. Oh, it's um, beautiful. It's like a bit of panto, right? It's really nice. Yeah, um, just delightful. And this is all in the script, right? So this is purely McGowan, like, again. I, I think he's really good at these sort of, like, quick back and forth like little snappy, interchanges. Yeah. yeah, these fucking, like, snappy, well-written bits of banter is just like, that's the shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's where his strength as a writer is, for sure. 100%. Um, so we get to the end of the scene and they've been like answering questions and he's just writing down on a piece of paper and right. You know, and the photographer is taking photos of him in the buggy. Right. Um, and they get off. The photographer runs one way, glancing back in a sort of weird way. And then we see the same man, the same Denny Cooper guy, uh, number 113B, who is like printing off big broadsheets. Mm-hmm. Right. Which already have the answers to the interview on it. And again, I ask you to, is this magecraft or is the stagecraft? <sighs> Well, I mean, he did write the answers himself. Mm, he did. So there's no reason this couldn't have been prearranged. Yeah. As we said, the picture in the paper is just his uh, Patrick McGowan promotional still. It's none of yeah. the pictures used previously. Yeah. Um, but there were two number 113Bs. Do we think they're twins? Is this a prestige situation? <sighs> Man, it's already weird that 113 and 113B have to share a number. Like, does that ever happen again? 
Uh, it'll happen in about five seconds. Uh, okay. In this next scene. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. All right. Um, but that's already weird, wait, wait, let wait, alone wait. like. Number six. Okay. No, wait. I just figured I figured out the B. Oh, okay. Oh. The, so number six lives in unit number six. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Number 13 and 13B are married. This doesn't oh. work. This doesn't work because of what's going to happen. Okay, so let me set this up. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get my answer. You're not playing the game. You're being number six. This is ideal. Um, so in the very next scene, right, we have the local assembly. Right. Right. The local oh, assembly no. is about. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt you. Before no, he, please. Before he goes in, who do we see? Rover. Rover is just there. Oh, yeah. Not or just there. He, like, something. descends like an yeah. angry god. He does. In front of uh, or behind. To herd him. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, a statue of At the Hercules. A- Atlas yeah. carrying. Or- it's Hercules. Uh, is it Hercules? <laughs> it's Hercules. Uh, there was a point where Hercules had to carry the Earth. Right, right, right. Uh, mm. Atlas was doing some other goddamn thing. He was thing. getting I the can't remember. I, lo- I looked this up. Um, I looked this up, but you can look this up. Mm-hmm. That statue is of Hercules. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it was very good having that juxtaposed. Absolutely. Um, but, like, but, like, yeah. Uh, Rover just shows up and is like, you're not going fast enough. Get moving. Yeah. Or something. Not this way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, what a use this of This is the Rover. first appearance of Rover in the script um, mm. and in the episode. But Rover would continually show up in the script. And in the episode, he only shows up again one more time at the end. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a mid- middle bit with the return, but we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. So you're totally right. Uh, and I think that Rover showing up here is really important because we're about to enter a sort of weird transition period in the episode. Yes. Right? Everything prior to this has mostly been on the up and up. Yeah. Right? You've all mostly agreed this seems like it's stagecraft. Everything mostly seems like it's sort of believable, weird village manipulation nonsense. Yes. Right? Everything after this is going to be very different. Yes. Right? I think so. Um, and true. I think it's really – I think it's really cool that we get Rover as like this vector of surreal mm-hmm. nonsense or unreality, right? Rover brings in the dream logic, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this could also be absolutely read as just kind of like, okay, you've followed the plan so far. Uh, we've been able to use our ready decouterments. Um and you're just going to have to keep doing it. Please don't go through that arch. That's not where you're supposed to go. Yeah, this um, is immediately followed by number two telling yeah. him, don't go that way, don't go that way. Yeah. So Rover could just be another vector of that. But I do like this That's idea. That's how I would have read it, yeah. but I, I do love the herald of, <laughs> of chaos yeah. idea. We'll, 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 we'll get to it more why, why I'm so set on this reading. But right. um, So local assembly room. Inside this local assembly room, it's first of all, it's so obviously number two's office, the set. It's really funny. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you, either of you noticed, but they just took the regular actual doors into this room and they put two big number two and number six vote for posters to cover it. I didn't. Oh, it's so good. That's good. I it's so that. funny. I love it. So what they've done is they've just added this like massive staircase into the room as if number two is descending. Sorry, number six is descending down beneath like the local assembly town hall building. Right. The set is actually different, but I do think that it's important to remember, right, other times when we've come up with like going beneath things, right? Where like, mm-hmm. for example, we know number two in A, B, and C lives underneath number two's office. Like he sleeps down there, mm-hmm. right? Oh yeah. Badly. Um, <laughs> surrounded by milk bottles. <laughs> he just didn't yes. have enough milk. Um, that's, that's always the problem. Yeah. It's always the problem for me. Um <laughs> And so I I think that it's important to keep in mind as we're continuing to think about the show about, like, how frequently dissent is, like, really important in terms of, like, uncovering things. Mm -hmm. Love it. So in this room, there are um, ten top-hatted people arranged in a sort of circle um, around the middle of the room with number two sitting at, like, a little, little slightly raised thing um, uh, in between them. And then above number two is this sort of raised dais with a throne on it. Pyramid throne with a blue blinking eye on it. Um, did any of you notice what the pins for all of these uh, numbers, all of these town hall or uh, local assembly peoples were? No, I couldn't see them. I was they not... are two A through two J. Oh, so oh. Good. I didn't know that. That's just great. So there's oh, I love it. So here's my so reading of the yeah. Yes. <laughs> here's my reading of the one thirteen and one thirteen B. I think it's about how the numbers are your role. So because 113 is the journalist's role, right? 113B is the colleague who helps the journalist. Number two is the Mm. role. 2A through 2J are the roles that help two, right? 
That's my read yeah. of it. Anyway. Interesting. That's great. I can so they're, see it now. They're now like, they're underlings. The yeah. The other thing that's really interesting is in the script, um, they're supposed to actually be reacting a lot more. In really? This scene. Oh, yes. Because they are dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're going to get to this later in terms of like where sort of the surreal silence comes from. Um, if they spoke, they would no longer be extras and they'd have to be paid. Got it. Um, and so because of that, you don't get any shots of them like reacting to anything. They are just completely static. Huh. So we can understand as a production mm. constraint why that is. But the actual effect of it in the episode is still really cool. Yeah. And so yeah. I just wanted to like say that before we got too deep in this scene. Sure. Oh, I see it. The num the their numbers are like they're on the down podium. on their individual podiums. Yeah. I yeah. I was like, how could I possibly read their badges? I was also but, like, looking at their badges. But, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's my bad. but it's totally on the podium. I, that's very fun. Yeah. That also could read as like party members or something totally. in this particular um Setting. you know milieu. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's it's great as underlings. Yeah, this feels very like boardroom of shadowy figures who are all making decisions for the organization or something like that, right? But are they making decisions? But because they're dressed so cheerily. They, they, they don't, they don't, they don't seem they, to be doing anything is the thing. They seem to just be hanging out. Yeah. 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 Number two reacts as if they all react u- unanimously to everything he says, mm-hmm. but they never react. Right. Right? No. Um, so these are the most figurehead of figureheads, right? Um, they are Which dressed in the nice stripes, but they do also have the top hats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. he calls them uh, mannequins or something like that, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. Taylor's dummies. There you go. Taylor's is what he dummies. calls them, um, which I thought was very mm-hmm. sweet. Um, but like, yeah, it's funny having because figureheads you usually think of as being uh, false receptacles for power, but this is sort of the other way around, right? Yeah. Um, where they are quote unquote supporting number two. He's been brought. I do. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no! I was just gonna say uh, I do love the um, the number as role thing because people do replace each other, and now I'm kind of like, are these roles comparable? Like you now I'm thinking back to There's other one more, okay, one more in this good. episode in the very next scene. Did you track what that guy's number was? Uh, I don't know what's the next scene. Uh, the mind reading scene. So um, uh, yeah, oh, let's guy. not get too oh, much sorry. further. Though. Here, I'll, I'll get us there. McGowan, or excuse me, number six, uh, acts out. Uh, the same way he sort of did at his speech. Uh, and yep. He sent yes. down uh, his podium is literally sent down further into the earth via an elevator. And he sent into the mic, uh, the Metal Gear Solid Four microwave hallway. He staggers. <laughs> Not before you can't just say a that. Bunch. Don't, don't forget how much he had to rotate. He rotates. Yeah, he, had to <laughs> rotate. <laughs> he rotates as he's yelling. He rotates down. It's a real Dark Souls elevator kind of thing. And then he goes through this bizarre, traumatic hallway of it's yes. very very like it's all red lit um he's yes. staggering through he's there's these convenient handholds that he's using to like yeah he's clearly being bombarded by something that is like disrupting his senses he's like staggering drunkenly through the space or something like that before he emerges into this brightly lit room but there's no information about this only no. the effects are seen exactly. and i exactly. think that is actually a lot of fun yeah Three things I want to uh, 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 put into Brennan's great explanation just then. Um, thing one, right? We get this great bit of number two, you know, suggesting, oh, hey, you're out of order. Uh, everybody agreed and then immediately hits the hammer, carried unanimously, right? Mm-hmm. Because they don't actually need to react. Right. Number two, haha, the next thing that happens is number six. Yes, there's this great spinning elevator nonsense. But the first thing that happens is the blue light from the throne, this like blue blinking light shoots on number six, right? We get this beautiful right. view of him all bathed in blue and he reacts as if this has done something to him. Right. Right. Um, and I think that's really important. And the other thing that I want the part B to be uh, uh, from this is Good. that in the script, we're supposed to hear Rover's scream in this moment, Oh. Uh, which we don't get. Um, and you know, who knows why, but it, there's an interesting bit of like, well, There's this weird moment. Go ahead. I was going to say, remember the original vision of Rover was that yeah. Rover subdued everyone by hypnotizing them, not merely exactly. beating them uh, with, with his body. Right. Yeah. Well, so we, we have sounds- in this moment, I think the first instance of like, this is super science, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Number six has been cowed via some sort of bizarre hypnosis, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, subdued. Yeah. And three, uh, this is the group therapy hallway. 
Yes, totally. It's 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 where they contemplate things. Yeah, yeah. It's where we get the pot goes the weasel, where they're all in their mm-hmm. their white like suit jackets, moving their feet up and down. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's yeah. that hallway. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it leads into the office of the labor exchange manager, right? Uh, who is number twenty six? Number twenty six, if we'll recall, was the number for number two's assistant. Oh, oh. that's right. When. Uh, in the very uh, in the the uh, Leo McCurran episode, Chimes of Big Ben. So in episode two, Chimes of Big Ben. Oh, great! And that actor who plays number twenty six in that episode plays number twenty in episode one, the labor exchange manager. Right. Ooh. So we have once again, this is a role. Number twenty six is the labor exchange manager. Is number two's assistant. Mm-hmm. Different people can be cast in that role as needed. And we know right. for sure, uh, for, for a fact, this guy just recently was cast in this role, right? Right. We'll learn that momentarily. Um, but I think that's really interesting as like, what are numbers? What is the meaning of the numbers? Mm-hmm. I, I think that this episode is making a really strong argument that it's about the role you have in society. This is a big fucking LARP is what this is. <laughs> it is a big LARP. Um, I think it's really interesting that I, I definitely didn't put that together previously. And that's Mm -hmm. interesting given that number two and number one are afforded such narrative weight by number six. Yeah. And yet it never occurred to me that like, oh, but does the rest of this work that way? Because we've already seen number two is a role that is filled by a number of different people. Why isn't it simply the case that every other number is that same way? And real quick, we should say this is the first time we're recording after the podcast has launched. Um, and I did want to say at the very beginning, and I totally forgot um, to thank everybody for all the great responses that we've gotten so far. It's really heartening. Um, but somebody did call us out in episode one of like, hey, why didn't you talk about how like number two being number two and changing out the, the character actors playing number two means it's sort of dehumanized and sort of like a metaphor for like society that number six is going against. It's because all the numbers are that, mm-hmm. right? The whole thing is that. Anyway, the actor playing number 26, before we get much further, is George Benson. Uh, he's a stage and screen actor. He played a lot of Vickers, <laughs> which I think you can see <laughs> I in can this see scene. That. I love a Vicar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Brendan, can you set up the scene a little bit? Boy, this is interesting. I, I, <laughs> this is an interrogation by a very, very nice man. who <laughs> with, with tea. Who has tea. As as always happens. A chair that happens. can electrocute you <laughs> and has a way to peer into your mind and tell yes. the veracity of whatever it is that you're thinking, whether it's true or false, and then project that information onto a screen. Yep. Um, God, I love that. And it is an interrogation that in terms of the information is meaningless. It is an interrogation <laughs> done to show done to demonstrate to number six that you are thinking wrong, that you need to, Mm. you need to be honest. And that if you are Mm. honest, then you can be of use here. You will have a good time here, but we have ways of knowing that you are telling the truth and that you are lying. And, and, and our our control is absolute. Well, and the content of what you are, uh, you know, these, the actual facts of what you're thinking, um, totally unimportant right it only matters whether you're compliant or not right um like i do not give a shit what you are thinking just if you're thinking correctly exactly um which is a lot of fun yeah also god the motion of those little the little circle and the little square like you can just you can just feel the person with the stick like <laughs> slowly. Along. it's so good it's a really really good representation so if you haven't seen the episode i love first it. of all i get it <laughs> but go watch it it's a good show. It's fun. It's got these two lines that are um, so that they're it, shadow puppets. It, it's a shadow puppet. Yeah. Imagine McGowan's head in silhouette, and there are two lines uh, at different diagonals going up to his eyes, basically. And on yeah. one of them is a circle, and on another one is a square, and they move at different rates and in different um, degrees based on whether or not what he is thinking is true or false. At least or according so to we number twenty six, and yeah. sometimes yes. both move at the same time. <laughs> Um, yes. yes. Uh, this is. And they, uh, uh, God, it's delight. Th- this gestures at what I was talking about earlier when I said I, I will talk about that later about what yeah. our exports are. 
um, the uh, what are we calling this guy? The interrogator. What is his number? He is the labor exchange yeah. manager, the labor number twenty six. Thank you. Um, who apparently came by this interrogation technique in the civil service? No, 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 no. He he adapted to it from the civil service. He he's from the civil service. He adapted immediately, according to one oh, of the seesaw guys, to become psychic in, in, interrogator or something like that. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, you know, you learn those skills. It's Sure. Fun. Um, very, very charming performance. Really, really good stuff here. Oh, he's um, phenomenal. And he's so good. talks, uh, he says very specifically, confidences are the core of our business. And mm-hmm. I think this ties into what number two, uh, Leo McKern was talking about, where he was saying the village as a model for the rest of the world. I think the village's exports are this society of thinking correctly, Control. this secrecy as control um this sure. idea that everything that you think is pr- we are privy to everything that you think and it is the onus is on you to think correctly or be punished for it yeah. i mean the the uh, the exports of the village are the village in some ways exactly exactly which makes sense it kind of it is very much uh self globalization and, exactly yeah we we sort of jumped to the the scene but i just want to hit two points on the setup real quick um, so one point in the setup is that, uh, number 26, as you've mentioned, is very friendly with this guy. Right. Um, and he asks him how many, you know, sugars do you take in your tea? And Patrick Baguin answers or number six answers, right? He says, I don't take any. Right. Mm-hmm. And number 26 says, of course I knew it anyway, mm-hmm. but he's asking as a pleasantry. Right. And number six responds truthfully, mm-hmm. which is a thing he will not do later. Right. This is episode two. Um, the, the second thing I want to get at is what we've already gestured at, which is this civil servant line, mm-hmm. right? So we see number two who's watching this happen on his big screen. There's not a lava lamp on it for the moment. There's different silhouettes. Um, I thought it was well, – the first time that I saw the silhouettes, I thought it was Problems Clown. But um, – <laughs> Oh, that speaks volume to me. Yeah. Um, so in, in this episode, he, number two sort of like, is like, oh, he's, he's got great technique, right? The way he's speaking to uh, number six here, mm-hmm. this is even before the psychic sort of thing happening. Um, and one of the guys on the seesaw, this is our first time getting one of the guys on the seesaw speaking, <laughs> um, says, oh, he, he's from the civil service. He adapted immediately. I, right? I really like that we have a seesaw person speaking because it demonstrates that these are actually like people that are part of the system and not just other brainwashed individuals. Right, because right. usually they're just completely inert. Like as right. far as we can tell, like they don't have any volition or exactly history yeah. or anything. Yeah. It's just yeah, yeah, it's totally true. This guy um, in the seesaw is Kenneth Benda. Uh, his full name is Charles Kenneth Anton Benda. Um, good name. He's credited as a supervisor, hmm. which is interesting because that's the same um, that's the same rank that they give to Peter Swanwick, who's the bald supervisor oh, right. we see a lot. Number twenty eight. We'll see him later in this episode, but it's archival footage. Mm-hmm. He wasn't really there. Mm. Um, and he was also in like, he was a TV actor. He was in Avengers and Dr. Who and things like that. I think that part of the reason why he speaks here is again, this production thing, right? This was the second episode. They could afford to have a, a speaking character mm. respond other than one person of our main cast here later on when the budgets got tighter, that no longer became an option. Right. Okay. Mm. I could see it. So now I think we're back at like this, this incredible interrogation oh. scene you've already yeah. set up. Real quick, yeah. Um, yeah, please. The uh, the whole like determining what how you take your tea and how that is like an interrogation like whatever tool um, yeah. is such a funny recurring concept, and I can only like it seems so like British. really arbitrary to me. But it, yeah, it's obviously it's incredibly British. Where it's like I assume this is just going for like, hey, this is supposed to be a comforting you know routine yeah. thing that is supposed to calm you down and yeah. you know be very aggressively normal. And here we are mm-hmm. fucking with you using that. I yeah. guess um, is there is there more to it that I'm missing? Because like. It's. It seems to be such a favorite technique. I think it's one of many techniques they use like this, mm-hmm. right? Fair. Where they're often playing around the social and social practices and, like, getting you to start to be on board and start to play their game. Oh, mm-hmm. games. Uh, via <laughs> these social practices, right? Like, breakfast is a common way they do this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this, like, set way that you interact, Right. Uh, we also get this with the literal games. Chess comes up a lot in this series, right? 
you have to play according to the rules, according to Hoyle, right? Right. Um, there's one other thing I forgot to mention earlier, which is uh, number two gets a call on the red phone. It's not the giant red phone that we saw from A, B, and C. It's a smaller red phone. And uh, But he, he's apparently being told off. He's like, oh, well, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I can't be too intensive with number six, I know. But he was he was going to get all these extras that we put in top hats in this one scene to revolt against me. You understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he calls the labor exchange manager, number 26, and, you know, Passes this on. He says, oh, yes, of course, I understand. Only the first level or mm-hmm. some other term. Don't yeah, damage yeah. the tissue. Mm-hmm. Tissue. Right. Tissue. 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 <laughs> um, and that's when number six senses danger and stands up. Because up until this scene, he's been perfectly fine. He's been in that mode that we see him in, like, number episodes one and two, where he's, like, very collegial, very relaxed, mm-hmm. right? But he senses danger this moment. He springs up as if he's going to, like, attack this guy, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And in that moment, he gets, like magnetically pulled back into the chair. Mm-hmm. But it's not automatic. He has to press the button. Does 26 press the presses the button to to pull him back in. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um yeah, which is it should be I don't know. I I I just love this like human mediated stuff where totally. it's like he had he was already leaning over the board and he he sensed that like number danger. 6 was going to was going to yeah, he sensed that there was a dangerous man, the danger man behind him and had, <laughs> it was like I got to press the button. Yeah. And yeah, it and it sort of magnetized him back in. Um But I do think this is, you know, in this scene, right? Uh this is our these are our first instances of like super science, right? Mhm. Mm-hmm, right. We don't really have magnet Patrick McGowan magnets. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, there's also the end point of this interrogation is really interesting, right? You've already gestured about this like square and circle going forwards and backwards. But at the end, both enter his mind or his sort of brain representation, mm-hmm. the shadow of his head at the same moment. Right? And the result is bad. It's truth and lies mixing together, which creates the perfect politician. <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> How do we read this moment, right? I think there is a metaphor at play here, obviously. I I have I have a hard time reading his behavior past this point. Um I think sure. it's difficult to tell yeah. at what moments he's being genuine. Uh, that is at what points he is brainwashed and so believes he is acting genuine versus moments sure. where he is playing the part of the politician because he's trying to escape. And I think the sure. show is being very deliberate about not being clear about which mode is which. And so if anything, I think maybe the which one is truth and which one is lies starts mm. here as like, oh, well, you mm. could tell you could tell the shapes apart when they were outside of his head. But now they're, we're going to jumble them up. Mm. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, that is an interesting read. I like that's, that a lot. That's a fun one. Um, yeah, I feel like, yeah, there are moments when you're like, OK, he's aware and moments when you're like, I don't think that this is intentional. But, yeah, it's harder to. um to pull apart than it could be. Uh, there is that really funny bit where, like, well, it's not, it's funny to me when I was watching this, rewatching this most recently, um, and they, the square and circle go into his head and he sort of gets like knocked out and has his head turned to the side. Um, and then 26 comes over and like opens his eyes to check him. Uh, it's, it, uh, the, when I was watching it, the thing that I said was like, oh, you got a square in there. Like, it's just, it's very <laughs> like, it's, it, it looks very much like he's like, what's it you did it go in properly right. like yeah. it's got it's got this sort of like this aspect to it which is this weird like physicalization of something that is supposed to be i assume conceptual um yeah it's, sure. it's like they're putting like, correct thought into his head absolutely yeah he's treating it like a concrete thing that occurred mm-hmm. yeah right. which is very fun <laughs> yeah i i mean i gestured at it with my summary but i'm much more on the this was a brainwashing approach of some sort, yeah. right? Um, I think it's pretty unambiguously that even if there is some truth and lies mixed in, there's some like how how would number six really campaign here? Mm-hmm. He is fundamentally not in his right mind throughout this whole sequence until we get to this escape that we've gestured at right. a few times. Actually, real uh I had one more note here Please. that is uh is this the first time that Number six has been questioned under hypnosis about something that isn't why did did you resign? resign? Oh, that's a really good question. Because I was like, this is a new one. Like, it seems so, you you know, usually they're so focused. Now that you mentioned that, I think aside from a throwaway line from number two at the very beginning of the episode, 
where he asks number six to give in. The question of his resignation doesn't even come up this episode. No oh, shit. Because it's the second chronologically. <laughs> They've got to break him, right? I think this whole episode is that they, but they, they feel like the they have episode. to break him. No, no, I get it. <laughs> sure. But that's a set of the stakes. Sure. Um, also, presumably, it's to see how he will react, yeah. Um, yeah. which is badly. Um, yes. And, and to be fair to them, which I don't, you never have to hand it to the village. <laughs> um, but to be fair to them for a moment, right, he is much more polite <laughs> after this. Yeah. Uh, like, he's sarcastic, but he's not punching anybody. That's a good point. Um, That's true. Anyway, speaking of punching people and yelling at women, uh-huh. uh, two of number six's favorite activities mm-hmm. – uh, he sometimes does, grabbing women. Sometimes grabbing women. And yelling at them. He does a little bit of uh, campaigning here as he's maybe brainwashed or maybe whatever square and circles do to you, just like moose and squirrel. Uh, they're also handing out number six pins in the labor exchange, mm-hmm. which feels... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you feels can like campaign may- in a government office. <laughs> uh, if the government wants you to win and they're also telling you that you're the... Uh, you know, you're the the spoiler candidate. You're the you're the real dem- democratic candidate. Now, Matthew, what are you saying? Surely the government wouldn't conspire in order to make sure that someone wins. No, definitely not. The government anyway, doesn't have control over that. What do you that's mean? That's crazy. And it, we're recording this before the November elections. Anyway, <laughs> um, so we then get this little bit after he's done some campaigning. There's like a lunchtime news bulletin where he's recorded a thing for. It's really funny. Oh God. Um, and he's watching himself do it, and he does the salute back to himself. He's just 100% swarmy, like, politician Fenella right Fielding yeah. says that uh, it's such a close race, they're neck and neck. Yes. Uh, as they stand back to back yeah. with yes. their oh, necks touching. Yes, horrifically, like, in this, like, horrible, like, composite silhouette. Mm-hmm. There, is, there is a particular tone that he does be seeing you with, like, the, just the snap, like, the, yeah. the sort of, like, like he's, like he's doing a little bit of a, yeah. There's a particular tone that he does with that that he does when he is meant to be not himself. Right. Right. Um, and, like, because, like, he absolutely... He has other other um, ways of intoning it where it's kind right. of like off the cuff or like or it seems like he is trying mm-hmm. to look like a team player. But this right. very much looks like he is fucking bought in. Yeah. He teaches the girl the salute, which in her own natural uh, her, her native language is lie easy to soon as opposed mm-hmm. to be seeing you. And she um, loves it. She loves, she loves learning it. it. She's so weird. She does it all. It's almost as good as pushing a button. <laughs> <laughs> let's. This episode really says let's let's you know uh, you got to give it to weird girls, right? She's um, the true. manic pixie uh, uh, <laughs> nightmare girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this appears to her mania appears to like get him out of this brainwashing or whatever, mm-hmm. and he immediately books it. He fights a guy for his boat, <laughs> takes his boat. This is a wildly expensive chase sequence. It's a lot. Like. You can really see how they burnt through their budget because <laughs> there's like boats going after him. There's a helicopter in the air that we're supposed right. to think that number two is flying. Mm-hmm. Um, this doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. Um, so Rover gets him. Um, it's actually very similar. It's really interesting that we, you know, uh, we just saw two episodes. This happened to Nadia, but Rover gets him in almost exactly the same sequence. It's just as silly this time. Right. We still swimming. have the three through the three rovers. <laughs> Pull him back. I don't right? understand they look this, like a this persistent uh, strain of logic that if I am escaping in a boat and rovers after me, I need to get in the water <laughs> and swim. Get out and swim. <laughs> it's very strange. Surely rover can can get into a boat, yeah. but not in the yeah. And like the best part was, of course, the rovers sort of dragging him ashore, and he's like reciting his little campaign yeah. promises yeah, while they cute. do so. Like what? Fun. Dragged once again by the unfortunate triple rover configuration. <laughs> yeah. There's one bit here that I really like, which is then Rover goes home. We see the footage play in reverse of Rover yes. going to the bubble Bye. backwards. Yeah. It's really fun. Sort of Godzilla returning to the bottom of the sea. Yeah. 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 The the one bit that I have for this uh, chase sequence is number two over loudspeaker in the helicopter saying, yes. don't be rash, give him time. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Because they, someone's about the, to brain him. Yeah. Calling off the, the goons. The attack. Yeah. Right. Um, because again, they have to have him, right? Body and soul. Um, so they put him, they take him back, they put him back in his room and then a lamp comes down. 
<laughs> like goes yeah, in his, <laughs> just kind of right onto his face. It's like a Cronenberg thing. It's so bizarre. It's so true. Um, they should have just brainwashed him in his room to begin with. Why did they go through all this? They can, well, so they can do it anywhere. That's what they want to prove it. That's true. That's yeah, true. That's, I guess. that's definitely part of it. But I, I do think to some extent that. You know, number two wasn't necessarily planning to send him to number 26 when he went to the local assembly, right? Mm. Sure. Because otherwise- He wants him to play the game, right? He wants him to play the game by Hoyle. They even reference it again at the beginning of that sequence, right? right? And and otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten the call from his superiors or whoever they are, right? Mm -hmm. To tell him like, no, 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 no. We saw what you just did. That's not to plan, right? Right. Right. Um, Anyway, so now we get this great speech. We get these like dueling rallies. (laughs) So good. It's a fun little sequence. I don't have a lot to say here. I don't know if you two do. He's giving a speech at the stone boat. Uh, There's just so many great, great little excerpts here. He's reading from a placard. He says uh, he's basically defending the notion of the village. He's saying, give us information and you will live a comfortable life here. Obey the rules and we'll take good care of you. Yes. You can enjoy yourselves and you will. You could you could partake of the most hazardous hazardous sports sports. and you will. (laughs) And you will. (laughs) Like, what um, is that campaign promise? You can partake of the most hazardous sports. What is in his head apart I mean, from a square? Well, per, per, perhaps it's a strange martial <laughs> yeah. art that we'll learn more about later. All right. Perhaps. Um, there's also really weird bits in the number two's responses, right? Because mm-hmm. one of the things he said about why you should vote for him, even though he doesn't actually care, as we know by the end of the episode, right, is because number six can't manipulate you like I right. do. <laughs> Well, he says, like, manipulate the, you know, whatever, the system or something yeah. or, mm-hmm. like... He's inexperienced. Uh, yeah. He's, he's never been a public uh, official. Yeah. It is very... It's, I mean, it's true. It's appropriate. Yeah. But, yeah, number six is making these promises, basically, that, like, vote for me and not only... Um, not only will you be free, but I will give you all the things that you want as part of that freedom. Right. What is your dream? I can supply it. Right. right. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, right. they can all be yours. Right. Apply to me, and it will be easier and better. God, yeah. it's so good. What do we mm-hmm. think that Patrick McGowan thinks about politicians and empty promises? I don't know. I'm keeping an open mind. <laughs> <laughs> he might turn around by the end of the episode and be like, you know what? This democracy thing is pretty good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems um, great. Less work and more pay. More Less play. work and, and more, more pay. play. Yes. Oh, I thought it was more pay. Is it more, more play? play? Fuck. It's, okay. yeah. it's I couldn't, games, I couldn't hear it. right? Yeah. It's the themes yeah. of games, sports, play, right. etc. cetera. Right? Delightful. This, this is a really good bit of script that I, I, I want to call out. He's basically entrapped number two. He's he's marched his yes. campaign to the, the green where number two is having his. They say six of one and half a dozen. for all okay it's six four two like as in six is up in the running for two so it's six four two yeah oh that's yeah six for two and two for nothing yeah that's that's one of those like that's one of those like uh whatever like kill phrases in my head for many years um (laughs) it's good it's like a nursery rhyme right like it's like pop goes the weasel which we see over and over again six for two and two for nothing six for free for all free for all and it's just like what what are you even saying it's so good this is yeah the best bit is that this is improvised this is not in the script this is not in the script i'm not surprised but also it is very cool (laughs) it's really cool right yeah Um, that's delightful but, but to get to the thing that I was setting up for Please. is that he basically entraps number two and he says, you're number two right now. Do you have what do you do with your leisure time? And number yes. two says, well, I don't I don't have any leisure time. I'm too busy. Number six says, ah, did you hear that? Yeah. Leisure. <laughs> leisure is our right. Well, he says he also says, do you hear that? He's at his limit. He can't do any more. Like and that's right. It's, yeah. it's very just like he just turns it on him and uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and throws some barbs. It's very cool. Yeah. It's really good. I really like it. I'm voting for him. <laughs> yeah? Are you going to vote for him? You got that, yeah. you got that black We should ask rosette? at the end of the episode. I'm, I'm, I'm going to write in. Um, Sweet. I, j- I just mailed in my my ballot. Uh, since I'm in Canada, I have to oh. vote via ballot in the States. Uh, I should have written in number six. You should have. So next we get the pub, right? We're in the, the, the cat, cat and mouse. And, uh-huh. <laughs> There's some love- great stuff in this scene. We have a little stone <laughs> lion. 
playing the drums. What? Ro- d- what okay. is- my, my notes say, the best image in the episode, the plaster lion rotating gaily near some drums. Yeah. It's so good. And I'm just like, just give me more of that. Yeah. This is maybe our first instance of, like, weird future mechanization that isn't, you know, directly Purposeful? evil. Yeah. Oh. This, this is like a Disney... It's like a Disney animatronic, right? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely it is. God, um, what fun. Then we get this scene with the waitress, right? He's trying to order alcoholic drinks. Now, that's interesting because if if uh, Chimes Big Ben was before this, he would already know that all the alcohol is, is non-alcoholic, but he doesn't. Mm, this weird. is the second episode. <laughs> um, anyway, so he finds that he can't have alcohol, which he's very mad at. He yells at another woman, his favorite thing to do. Um, I did want to call out that the waitress here is number 255. Uh, this mm. is our biggest number that That's we've a high seen. Number. Yeah. yeah. We got a 195 from an old lady in like a crowd react shot in this episode. Mm. There's so many numbers. I don't have all of them in this episode. But it's really interesting because we're getting at least a sense of like what scale of village are we talking about here, right? Sure. We're talking, you know, in most scenes because of the amount of extras that you can have, we're usually looking at a few dozen people at most. Mm-hmm. But like there's an implication here that we have hundreds of people here. Totally. Which I think is interesting. Um, or that it is at least planned as if it could support hundreds of people. Totally. Absolutely. I also should say this is Holly Doon, uh, who was mm-hmm. a British TV actress. So this is sort of just a, a bit part for her. Very good. He asks, you know, who's you voting for? She says, only for you. Very flirty. Um, <laughs> I really liked her uh, as brief as she is there because she is one of the only people that acts – normally when he acts like such a weirdo he gets yeah. so mad at her yeah. and she has the decency to look frightened and go away yeah whereas so many other villagers like, okay. are just such weird automatons yeah yeah there was a comment on the youtube video that was like what is going on something is bad wrong with these people and it was like <laughs> yeah yeah i think so i think there might be something wrong with the village that may be uh. true I, d- I do have in my notes you can tell six is himself because he yells a lot <laughs> yells yeah. at women specifically yeah i mean um yeah. So number You're not my wife. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, so number 58, right, his handler this whole time takes him away to a secret bar. <gasps> now, surely she surely she knows about this because of her photographic memory, right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> That's how it works. That's how you learn about yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also like singing to himself at this point. He's like, the, vote for me. Vote for me. I'm, I'm for, for you. you. Let, Let me, me be. see and be. Tra-la. What yes. you are. Just sort of tunelessly singing to himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we go to the secret bar cave <laughs> where a mad scientist who they have imprisoned <laughs> runs yeah, a they secret have this distillery. One guy. one guy with chalkboard. Yep. He's doing some environmental storytelling down there. Yes. <laughs> and in the meanwhile, he brews something. Yes. The, this is another instance of uh, number two. Number two's always love to brag about people they have under their thumb. They're it's like true. very That's true. excited about it. They're like, we got this guy. And this was another one of those where he was like, oh, we just keep him here and give him a chalkboard. It's great. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> Did either of you, you know, the first time that you saw this, if you can uh, recollect that, mm. did either of you buy this idea that number two is like really drunk here. I not necessarily even really drunk, but is like telling the truth when he oh. says like, Oh, screw hell at the village. I don't care about any of yeah, this. This is question. the one place you can go Yeah, where there's no surveillance that I could finally be myself here, which is an alcoholic as he says. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With his weird, his weird little shawl, like what an odd signifier that is mm-hmm. like, yeah. uh, what a strange little bit of costuming. Yeah. Um, right. I So I believed it because mm. the first time I watched it, um, because I was reading number two the first time I watched it as someone being put a, put upon to do this by his superiors mm. um, right. who really wanted to actually play the game with number six. Mm. Um, right. I think the end of the episode obviously contradicts that reading. Um, but at first, I was thinking that like the true number two, right, was actually the one responsible for what was going on here. Mm. Sure. I could um, I mean like I could see it still. Like it, it can still work. He can he can want to have things go a particular way and still know that there's gonna be an ending regardless of what happens. Sure. I, I mean, mean we'll like get to, I'm not you know. We'll get to it after the election as well. But mostly I think I attribute this to just Eric Portman acting the hell out of it. Oh, like, yeah. I think yeah. I totally believe that he is in this position where 
he can finally let down his mask yeah. and like talk yeah. about what it is that he wants to talk about. I think he's doing a really good job. Totally. Here. I, Cause like, no one would ever believe this of the uh, the A, B, and C number two um, with the milk. No. Like, if he tried to pull this, no, everyone would be like, <laughs> you know, come on, buddy. Yeah. So, like, he's this well, this number two all, is a better actor. It would be a milk right. bar instead of ah, an alcoholic bar. Obviously. You're right. Perfect. You do the Clark Kent thing. <laughs> I'm addicted thing. to milk. As long as I come back to civilization, I'm fine. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Keep him down here with his chalkboard and his cow. <laughs> Once a week, we clean up after the cow. <laughs> so um, the man in the cave, which is, by the way, how he is uh, credited in the episode. It's man Great. in cave. Good. Uh, mm-hmm. Which yeah, is. I've read Plato. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, it's it's so interesting. Anyway, this is John Casabon. Um, mm. The prisoner would be the last time that he ever acted, but we'll see him again in a future episode. Mm. Um, he's also supposed to have a beard again to like sell. He's like the weird, you know, right. sage in the cave. Right. Uh, uh, they just sure. didn't give him a beard. I think that's funny. It's fine. Anyway, so yes, as we've already gestured at, number two kind of like seems to be taking number six into his confidence. He reveals this blackboard on which John Casabon's man in a cave supposedly writes scientific ex- you know, secrets. And they like take a picture of it every so often and then they erase it as like this metaphor for how they've like perverted science, right? How they're taking advantage of it. Um, but then, of course, sure. it turns out that the drink is just spiked. Number two is pretending to be drunk. They've again knocked him out. And again, the drink has brainwashed him. It'll take him through the end of the election. Brainwash three. Yay. What? What? Why do they do this? <laughs> Great question. My my thinking on this is that they are, uh, they, they their whole goal is to get him elected by the village and in the number two room for this final sequence. Like that's yeah. what this is mm. all for. And they need him to play the game until then. And their only way they, to do that is to use weird super science to brainwash him repeatedly. Do you think then that 58 sees him in the bar and sees, Oh, he's being belligerent. I need to trigger the plan where I take him to the bar. Yeah. Um, Probably. And, we get him drugged there in order to put a stop to this. Yeah. So he doesn't do anything else more belligerent this evening or something like that. Although exactly. it's a perfect setup because he's all like, why can't yeah. I have booze? And she's like, wow, yeah. do, we can do booze. Okay. Um, we're going to yeah. do the booze plan. Yeah. If he instead had been like, <laughs> right. I need candy. They would have taken him to the candy plan. <laughs> right. And number two would have been there. And number two would have been there. It's like, I need to go to a strip club. They take him to the strip club plan. Right. Like it's always the same scientist there. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. just how it is. <laughs> Yeah, um, he's the, on the pole. The, he does the, a lot of jobs. The strip club at the village would be the most <laughs> chaste situation in the entire world. Patrick Morgan would not allow it. We would no. only see the outside of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it'd be the same silhouettes that we saw the brainwashing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God. So we, we basically jump immediately from this to the end of the election, right? Right. Um, people are dropping the pins that we've seen this whole time, like the number six or the number two pins, just into boxes that are like just this. in front of number two and number six. Yep. In case you forget what you're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really like this. I think this is such a like clear um, visual for the election, but mm-hmm. it also calls attention to like how much of like a high school student council yeah. like, sort of set up this whole thing is. It's really good. No, yeah. imagery wise, it's perfect. Yeah. Like the whole yeah. thing with, you know, it's, it's the payoff of people wearing mm-hmm. the rosettes. Like yeah. they can concretize that into their support. It's great. Yeah. Um, also, Ever six says, sorry. He does. He apologizes for winning. Yeah. He's so sweet. Yeah, it's cute. He's so he's he's six. He's, when he's hypnotized. Yeah. He's yeah. He seems very uncertain in this moment. It's like, yes, yeah. He's he's not quite sure why he's here or what he's doing. And yes. he certainly does not play well to the people. Right. Um, he waves uh, vaguely at them. And they stare back and at silence. And they just fucking stand there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, music call out here. They have a nice little ominous um, uh, orchestration of for he's a jolly good fellow. Oh, yes. And he is a jolly good fellow. You both already gestured at it, but they leave. And, right, they, they're like, okay, he's won. And the crowd no sells it. <laughs> Nothing. The script is completely the opposite. The script is supposed to say that they erupt in cheers. There's confetti. There's drums. Wow. There's supposed to be an actual celebration here. Huh. But they don't do that. Yeah. Right? And instead, we get this moment of, like, deep, unpleasant, surreal tension, 
right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, right. that's really interesting. Because like the, it's interesting to be to put forth the thing where the concept where he's like he's in deep hypnosis. He has mm-hmm. played his part. It yeah. mm-hmm. ba- like we're basically done here. There's no reason to have any more pomp and circumstance. Sure. Um, and so like that's you know a good weird unsettling. Um, uh, tone to strike, but if they yeah. had been all excited about it, it wouldn't have done anything more. Yeah, we wouldn't yeah. have gotten the the like the twist reveal of this all truly is for nothing until you know number fifty eight starts slapping him. But right. Instead, we get it here, right? Of like, yeah. this is an empty practice, right? Yeah, you can tell right away from here that it's like, oh, this is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I so I think it's a really clever bit of like on site directing to be like yeah. this is this isn't working here's what we should do mm-hmm. instead yeah no right. reaction that's that's a lot of fun um they go and, and go wait, just just to emphasize like it's a lot of like close-ups of yes. like the extras being just like stone-faced yeah mm-hmm. Re- yeah really really no selling it yeah. yeah 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 and then we get the the situation where number two literally leads number six by the hand yes. yeah <laughs> up to the fucking dome yeah. which is like it's weirdly charming, but it's it's also super very much like you are not compos mentis at this time. He's We're like just going to make sure you get there. <laughs> right. He's like in a childlike state in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, he basically just like brings him to the doorway of his office in the Green Dome uh, and number 58, notably, and then just like mm-hmm. leaves the two in there. It's just like, just press buttons, you'll figure it out. Like, yeah. Yeah, he, he explicitly brought him here uh, under the pretense of like, I'll show you the ropes. And then he gets him there right. and he's like, all right, good luck. Never no mind. point in boring you with detail. Anything you want to know, press a button. You're right. the boss. Yep. And, um, and 58 notably, is excited. <laughs> she, lo- she loves buttons. Loves this. She, she loves, loves buttons. buttons. <laughs> oh, number 58. Um, <laughs> we're going to we're gonna save her by the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can fix her. Yeah. <laughs> But it, I could not. I could not fix her. It's interesting, right? That like even in this moment, we've seen number two, original number two's lie is just fully exposed, mm-hmm. right? Number one is still a mystery to number six. Right. There was no no effort has been made to like reveal what's going on there, right? Right. Right. So yes, there's this silly bit with the buttons, and then number fifty eight suddenly like again all smiles the whole time, and suddenly she's stone faced and starts slapping him. Yeah. Well, she does this weird, like, this thing where she's watching his reaction really carefully yes. when she's mm-hmm. when she's pushing the buttons and, and the... Um, the flashing lights Hypnosis are going. lights are occurring. Yeah. And she, she does this, like, she kind of does this weird transition between being like, yay, buttons! And then she's, like, looking really closely at his face, but still, like, very expectant. Like, okay, you're going to do it or something. And then I guess he doesn't do it or maybe he does do it. And she is like, well, it's time to wake you up. Yeah. It's I, very, I think, yeah. I emotionally think strange. Next, yeah, it's totally strange. But I, I, I think like similar to like Nadia that we pointed out in that episode when like we see her reacting in ways because mm-hmm. she's thinking about the plan and if the plan is working, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in this moment, right, we were told explicitly that like the latest potion uh, the latest brainwashing should only have taken him through to the election, but clearly uh. he's still in this childlike state. And that's what uh. I think she's checking for. Uh, yeah. That's a great and she point. she leads him by the hand as well. Yeah. 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 Great point. And then she starts slapping him to like rouse him, to bring him back to mm-hmm. himself. And notably he starts coming back. And I, we, I think we see the moment when she recognizes that he's back and he, and she keeps slapping him because I think that she's just a sadist. Perhaps. I think she's real sick of this axis she she's been pitting. Could on. be sick of him and yeah. this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but she slaps him like into the chair with like incredible force. Uh, yeah. She says tick, tick over and over again. Yeah. Like, tick, clock. tick. Yeah, yeah. Like she uh, has had to. So number six does come back to himself, whatever is going on there. He mm-hmm. yells through the microphones. We see the the sort of speakers throughout the village as they echo out this pronunciation that he has control, that everybody mm-hmm. should use this as an opportunity to escape. He does it desperately again and again. There is no response. Nothing yep. happens. Yep. I am in command. Obey me and be free. What yeah. a thing for number six to say, though. Like Free for I, all. Well, just straight up. Obey me and be free. That be free in the way I want you to be. Specific, yeah. yeah. That is a very specific statement, Mr. CX. I am in command. I am in command. Yeah. yeah. Two boys 
come up from the boy elevators. <laughs> okay, so this, the 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 script and the the credits call these mechanics, and they are sure. wearing the same like They're blue the onesie that we see. Yeah, the mechanic in the first episode wearing. Um, these are two uh, stunt actors uh, who uh, are playing our mechanics here. These are Peter Brace. Who's our first mechanic and Alf Joint, our second mechanic. Alf Joint? Those are both amazing. Um, So they're both just stunt performers, right? So, like, they're here because they can do fight scenes. And the question is, can they do fight scenes? I'm not so sure. (laughs) Fair point. This is the weakest bit of the episode to me. Yeah. Um, They just sort of tussle around for a little bit. They go through a back door we've never been in. And this leads us to a cave. What's in that cave? What do we find in this cave? Yeah. In the cave, there uh-huh. are four there are four more boys. Oh yes. my god. All these boys are wearing sunglasses. Yes. And, and what are they staring at? Rover. Oh, this part. Yes, thank you. I forgot this was here. And it's as if they're like contemplating the orb. They're straight yes. up contemplating the orb. Yeah. yeah. They're up late contemplating the orb with the boys. Yeah. It's so strange. In it the same way like, that they were, you know, in the same way that the hypnosis guys were you know, in the red light and the straight jackets. Yeah. Uh, Except they're doing it very casually. They're just in a cave in office chairs wearing sunglasses. sunglasses. It yeah. is oh, so strange. And, which I forgot this, uh, they do actually look at number six when he comes they by. They do, unlike, and they watch him get beat up for a little bit. Unlike not, the previous. Not only that, they help. Eventually, they? yes, they do help. Yeah, yeah so they, 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 they restrain him. We get the crucifix moment. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I lost track of the guys. <laughs> a lot of I'm always Too saying many. this. Um, <laughs> Where's my boys? <laughs> um, I, I didn't call out super well, but like in Chimes of Big Ben, right? We see him being a carpenter like Jesus, right? In this it's episode, perfect. we see him metaphorically get crucified, right? right? I brought up in our first episode, there is a real religious reading of the prisoner. Mm-hmm. We see this moment's happening of the sort of linking of him and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um but anyway, they, they grab both his arms and they they beat him in some of the worst stage fighting I've ever seen in my life. It's very original Star Trek. It's so bad. And yet, this scene was originally cut down because it was considered too violent oh, no. for TV. Too brutal. The version that we are watching is the full extended version of the fight. I don't know mm-hmm. if the tiny trickle of blood at the corner of his mouth is really what put it over the edge. but Probably. Yeah, apparently it was originally regarded as too violent. Blood is often uh, a determiner for these things. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. So we are supposed to read this as like him being beaten very violently. Right. right. Um, which is an interesting an interesting contrast to earlier in this very episode with don't damage the titsu. Right. right. I mean, it's it's a surprise in, in general. It's kind of like we do we need to do this? <laughs> like. Well, I mean, to, to to that point, once they bring him in and show him off to the real number two, mm-hmm. what does she do? She says, are you willing to talk? She doesn't actually interrogate him. She doesn't right. uh, ask, why did you resign? She doesn't ask any of these things. She simply says, this is only the beginning. Well, yeah, so she says, will you never learn? This mm-hmm. is only the beginning. This yeah. is the second episode chronologically. <laughs> We have many ways and means, but we don't wish to damage you permanently. Yeah. Are you ready to talk? And of course, he doesn't say anything because he just got like walloped in the stomach a mm-hmm. million times. Right. And they take him on a stretcher to his bed, to his beddy pie. Yeah, not not to a medic or anything. Yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. dump him in his fucking bed. Basically. And then we get the scene of the two number twos speaking. They're using mm-hmm. the red phone to right. speak to one another. Which suggests to me that the person on the other end of the red phone earlier this episode was number 58, a.k.a. the new number two. Mm. Um, And this is when we get the little exchange about, like, you know, number two saying, just my way, everything going according to plan. Uh, Number 58 saying, or number new number two saying, don't worry, all will be satisfactory in the end. Give my regards to the homeland. And that's the end of the episode. Certainly is. What do we think about these boys in the cave? So the official prisoner's companion calls this the rover cult, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Interesting. It's a very interesting concept that like 1960s, 70s, right? That like, you know, this is what a cult looks like. It's a whole bunch of white men sitting in a room staring at an orb, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's not wrong. Is it not? Yeah. 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 I mean, 
Well, I, I don't know. It seems, I mean, maybe it's that. I don't know. Um, but wow. I, it said to me more that they were, these are, you know, enforcers and they are hanging out with Rover because Rover does the same thing. Like this is, it's sort of like a security cave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, security cave. We're going to see the caves beneath the village again. Mm -hmm. It is worth remembering this um, for those of us who have seen this before. These are going to be important. What lays beneath? I I didn't bring it up the second time it happened, but there was supposed to be another rover scream this time when the lamp brainwashes him. Oh, man, I missed that. That they should have done that. That would have been great. They should have done that. And so to me, I think the reveal of rover in the cave is you know, at least according to the script, this intention of like, again, Rover is the vector by which sort of hyper science, super science, magical realism enters into our story. Mm. Right. Because it's the second that Rover shows up that we start getting the things that can't just be explained as stagecraft. You'll note that I stopped asking is the stagecraft or magecraft, right? Because like a magnet chair for Patrick McGowan's and the ability to read your mind and the ability mm-hmm. to brainwash you in these days is also clearly super science. We don't even need to ask or act about it. Right. And so it's this moment that we get this sort of like final bit of like, yes, here's Rover. This is what it's all been leading to. Right. Yeah. I wish he had done something. Cause he's really is just sort of sitting there. He's almost like in like a little <laughs> recess or something yes. like that. <laughs> I just, I just, you know, I'm I'm here for Rover. I want Rover to be okay. Love love a Rover. Yeah, yeah love, love a big dog. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's tr- I could definitely see the um the association of Rover with like mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it's more more like a manifestation of just like here's how we control. Here is the right. control. And sure. you know, these these goons, these boys are uh you know, contemplating the perfect uh grasp mm-hmm. on control that rover has and wishing mm-hmm. to have the same or what have you um yeah but like a, yeah yeah i was gonna say there there's a reading there of like these are drones waiting to be deployed no less than also rovers, yeah right Absolutely. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah there's a are. moment leading up to that when mcguin has finished yelling over the telephones and um number 28 is contempl- is like looking at him expectantly where yeah. he's like looking at a circular white light over and over again and is sort of like being not roused, but certainly like captivated by it. And yeah. I think that imagery is certainly deliberate. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think the other sort of thing we just heard at right at the beginning of this was like how deeply we want to read this as a narrative or a parable or an allegory. Right? Yeah. Clearly this is trying to say something about electioneering and I wonder what and society, (laughs) right? Is Um, it just that, Hey, these things are bad and you shouldn't trust them. Or is there some other deeper meaning to it? Cause on the surface, it seems like a very like kind of toothless parody of elections. Um, so like surely there is more to it. We can extract. Um, I mean, so I think number six, number six is, yeah, I think number six is one speech that he gives fully in his right mind, right? Is very wake up sheeple. Ah, it is, yeah. He's saying explicitly, a lot of you have given up, Mm -hmm. right? You no longer believe that you can, you know, escape the village. And if we're going to take the village as a representation of society or of the society that Patrick McGowan feared was coming up. Right. And he's basically speaking to the audience there, right? And he's saying, hey, a whole bunch of you have already given up. Mm-hmm. You've already said there's nothing that can be done. Mm-hmm. We can't change the world. We can't change society for the better. We can't escape this sort of incoming totalitarian thing, right? And so I think that there is a bit there of Patrick McGowan speaking directly to the audience right. um, about elections, about the press, about society, saying – you shouldn't just trust the things the press are saying. Mm-hmm. And as you're both gesturing at, this is a little bit like baby's first political thought. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which, you know, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's that's the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it is notable that, like, Patrick McGowan himself has expressed all these opinions we would, again, sort of nowadays consider to be, like, libertarian ideals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so – 
his sort of solution to the problems is not, okay, we're going to radically transform society. Mm -hmm. It's we're going to run away. Right. And or I am going to take control and free everyone through my beneficent <laughs> command. Oh, but yeah. even then, right, Listen to it's, me. Con- it's control such that people will leave. Right. Right. Go right? go rule yourself. Right. Yeah. This is yeah. this is not a this is not a productive concept of like mm-hmm. what do you do with power? Right. Right. Or right. a vision of or, or a vision of society once we have gotten rid of the bad parts of it. Right. Exactly. It's not productive to be like, you're in power's radius, leave the radius. Like that's right. not exactly. yeah, like okay. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. yeah, it's not meaningful. Everyone should get on their own boat and drive as far yeah. away as fast as possible. Using um, a tapestry. In, the, um, <laughs> in this yeah. interview that we've referenced a couple times that I think well, who was it with, Brendan? Was it with like the University of Toronto or something brought him yes. out? Yeah. Um, Patrick McGowan would afterwards say that a lot of where the prisoner came from was his feeling of like having to conform to society and having to do all these things that mm. he didn't want to have to do. And when the interviewer asked him, well, what do you do about that? He says, well, I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I think this is a, a much more of like, I'm trying to expose the light of truth right? to right. the secret truth that only I, Patrick McGowan, the wise have seen. Um, well, Without any real notion. Yeah, go ahead. Charitably, it's a, I'm having this experience and I'm making art about it. I mean, like, that is, you know, a fair way to behave. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, bringing up these concepts and drawing attention to them is like, it's not worthless or anything. No, Um, totally. But like, but yeah, like, yeah, point taken. There is, there's not, there's kind of a big question mark at the, uh, at the end of the. And then what? Well, this isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th- this this is a quote that I've been wondering where to factor in, um, and I think it's a good compliment to that, mm. um, which is from Lou Grade, who is the producer yep. um, from the In My Mind documentary. And it's part of a bit where they're talking about how difficult to work with McGowan could be, how abrasive he could be as an individual. Yep. What a surprise. And Lou, yeah. And Lou Grade says, "Someone, somebody once asked me, how do you get on with Pat McGowan? I said, very easily. I have no problems with him at all. Well, how do you do it? They asked. I said, I just give in to him. <laughs> I left it entirely in his hands. I was absolutely contented. I thought Pat McGoon was a star in whatever he played in. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's worth noting that this sort of thing they did where like a star wants to leave a show and so they like do this whole other thing for them is a thing they'd already done with like their, oh, their prior Oh, Lou Grade in particular would do it over and over and over again yeah. to great success. Absolutely. Mm. But- as we have seen and continue, will continue to see many times throughout this production, it is Pat McGowan's way or the actual highway. Yeah. <laughs> they have highways in England? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think – what are they, they call them canals over there. <laughs> um, with that, let's go on to one of our segments, number one with a bullet. This is something within the episode, whether a performance, a scene, a bit of dialogue – that stands out as your absolute favorite thing from the episode. Matthew, mm. do you have one? Yeah, um, I'm going to break break form, just as this episode breaks form. Shit. Uh, and not list a specific sort of, you know, actor that I think really saved or really, like, won the scene. Um, I think it's just that whole buggy ride, the interview. Mm. Uh, yes. I think that's such a, a beautiful little scene. It's a great little example of Patrick McGowan being really good at writing quick, witty back and forth dialogue. You get this little bit of like, you know, the reveal of 113B being in two places at once, right? There's a really um, good bit in between that where as the photographer, uh, excuse me, photo- photograph, photography, colleague. A, a, a photo- photographic photography, colleague, pho- <laughs> or 113B says <laughs> after he's gotten off the cart, shakes uh, number six's hand and says, thanks for seeing me. And then rounds the Ooh. corner and then Magoon turns around and sees him selling the newspaper. Oh, yeah. great. Which is so magician stagecraft coded. Yeah, that's um, good. Just fun. Anyway, yeah, that's that's my that's my MVP. Not to mention the whole, you know, uh, seeing you concept. Uh, exactly. That is very. Yeah. Carl, do you have a favorite moment performance line? Yeah, it was, the fucking, it was the fucking line with the drum. God, yeah. <laughs> like, give me a whole show of that. I love that uh, so much. It was, it was so like, 
I don't know, it felt so, like, weirdly joyful, like, in as a strange little island in this, like, weird, scattered, like, just tortured episode. Um, <laughs> like, in, in the sense of, like, you know, the characters are being tortured. And also, it, it really was very, like... It was it was oddly structured, um, but just the fun of that. Good heavens, I loved it. Yeah, I would really like to hear from the art production, like what the thought process was behind putting that together. That'd be really interesting. I think Absolutely. That's, that that's really worth calling out is that like number six is defeated utterly at the end of this. It is yeah. it mm-hmm. is broken in a way that we have not seen it before, even in episodes where he's lost. Yes. And I think that this episode, for whatever its faults are, does a really good job of balancing. This is uh, an episode with a downer ending, but it has yes. so many moments of weird mirth along the way that it does a totally. good job of not just having it be a death spiral the entire way through. That's a great yeah. point. Um, mine is going to be the thing that I called out before, the waitress number 255. Sure. Uh, working at the cat and mouse, trying to serve the non-alcoholic whiskey, vodka, or gin. Yeah. Tastes the same. All tastes the same. Yeah, has the decency to act shocked when a man yells at him. <laughs> what? There were so many so? weird little throwaway bits in this, though. Like the yeah. the sort of like where Pat, uh, at the breakfast scene at the beginning, where Patrick McGowan is like, "Oh, it's French food," and number two is like international, international, international. like uh, what? Like what? <laughs> they're an international community. <laughs> yeah, of course. But There's no like, such thing as states anymore. I uh, right, but God, what a what a joy. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how much writing Patty Fitz had done before this, but I think it's very well put together. Good old Patty Fitz. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Not Fink at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I really think, especially at this conversation, that like this new number two, number 58, is just a sadist. <laughs> I can see that. Um, and I, I think that a lot of this is like, we've got to break him to build him back up, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the rest of the series after this episode, what we see is this like, you know, this guy who seems disaffected, but is disaffected in a very traumatized way, mm-hmm. right? Is disaffected as a way of self-defense. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody was saying to me earlier that they didn't think that this show like had a narrative or like character arcs. Um, and I strongly disagree. That's not true. I, yeah. I think that this this episode especially just like showcases so clearly that number six is a person who changes throughout series even if we hop all around the place because they couldn't figure out what timing was i mean a lot of television didn't figure that out either uh for a very long time so um i think it's time to rate this show let's Mm. rate it as i gestured at the very beginning of this recording uh i don't think this is an episode that we can consider good or bad in a strictly narrative (laughs) sense um I i think there's there's too much going on it's too dense Mm-hmm. So I would like to suggest that I'm going to rate it one triangular throne with a blue eye out of a square of truth. Perfection. And if you really want that to be numbers, it's three out of four because of the number of sides. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, shit. Yeah. Nice work. Thank you. I appreciate what it is that you're trying to say. <laughs> but I think in terms, I'm I'm a much more grounded individual. Your 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 head's up in the clouds. I'm always saying uh-huh. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so tall. You're six foot twenty. <laughs> no one no one can stop you walking wherever you want to walk. There's so many I'm, triangles in that head. I'm mm. down. <laughs> there's so many triangles. I'm down here on the ground. I am just taking the thing at face value. I'm trying to yeah. figure out eating my dinner. I'm turning on the telly. Yep. I want to watch an episode of television, and I want to assess that episode of television in and of itself. Yep. I think this is 60 out of 99 ska glasses. <laughs> we usually, okay, yeah, sure. Uh huh. Carly, do you have a rating for this episode of no. The Prisoner? <laughs> <laughs> what if you uh, did? Yeah, I don't know. What if? Um, I think it is, yeah, overall, like narratively, it, is not super cohesive um but there's so many good lines uh so like i don't know if we're if we're going for like continuity and audience comprehension uh it's got to be kind of middling um uh you know whatever um half out of whole uh Uh, maybe could i suggest you could rate it uh number 26 out of number 58 
Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say two out of six is too harsh, um, yeah. but um, but then uh, like there's just so many like snappy little bits of patter and yeah, um, God, some of the phrases are just so, and it's still like I don't know, my my brain is like, hey, you should think about six for two and two for nothing over and over again. Um, it's just like one of those like. One of those Despite phrases. everything, it's an episode that sticks in your head. It is. And it's like, honestly, and the visuals are strong. The visuals are super strong. Like the whole, like the the posters, the, you yeah. know, the parades, the like, um, you know, the freaking cue cards, the like, it's it's all very like, it's, it's up there. Um, it's iconic. The show would not yeah. be what it is it without is. it. It is. And so, yeah. Um, Carla, you brought up a point that I just wanted to really quick slip in here. Yeah. Which is that since the first episode, we've talked about how the audience is aligning with number six, mm-hmm. right? Um, right? Like number six is confused when we're supposed to be confused. He's comfortable when we're supposed to be comfortable. We could read the mess of this episode as an intentional thing, right? Number sure. six's own perception of these events is messy. It That's is fair. through the lens of being drugged, being hypnotized. We notably don't even see anything from him being drugged in the cave to the election. There's this notion of, like, lost time here. That's true, right? Yeah. Whether or not, you know, that succeeds for you, whether that lands for you, who knows? Uh, but I, you could imagine that being part of the intent. I mean, it's definitely arguably used elsewhere in the series as well, if we want to go there. And I, I definitely understand, you know, I'm always, I'm the uh, chronology defender. Um, <laughs> I, I definitely understand this idea that they put together this really out there episode and then mm-hmm. looked at what they had and it was like, well, we can't, we can't put th- that. Yeah. We can't put that out as the second episode. No one's going to keep watching. We better, yeah. let's take this Leo McCurran episode and move it up. That's what we're <laughs> good. I yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah. I get it. And it's A, B and C, point. which we already talked about is like explicitly in the text being out of order. Yeah. Mm, a, B and C is so like normal comparatively. It <laughs> like, is. It's, I rewatched it, it when I was uh, watching this one. Cause I was just like, let's just get a little bit of context. And like, yeah, it's so like things happen. People cause them to happen. It's just very like, everything is telegraphed. It's, it's very clear. But yeah. there, there is notably still dream logic because there's literal dreams. That is and true. And there's super science, right? That which is, is like true. the connection. But they do take care to explain why those dreams are doing things. Yes, at at totally. every point, there's always totally. like, you know, hey, make this dream do this. No, I can't. It's a dream, you know, or like, yes, I can. And here's how, you know, and it's very like, uh, it's very simplified and explained. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really good. I wonder how this episode would land if we hadn't just watched A, B and C and had yeah. like the extent of their super science like established. Yeah. It's, um, it's a hell of a contrast. Mm hmm. Yeah, because as far as we're concerned, the village can basically do anything at this point. Pretty much, yeah. Can can and will. <laughs> we'll see more of that in episode five. But the next thing, if you're listening to this podcast, will not be our thoughts on episode five. That's right. We're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we are what? eventually going to do it. <laughs> next uh, time yes, Brennan, on The Prisoner's please. Dilemma, we're going to do the first of our bonus episodes. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a look at what came before as we take a look at Danger Man? Mm-hmm. My goodness. I'm just hearing a straight man in this announcement. <laughs> 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 wow, this sounds great. <laughs> Carly, have you Thank ever you. seen Danger Man? Uh, I haven't really, no. I've seen like a couple episodes when I was like a child. but uh, I have uh, never seen it. I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. We are going to watch four episodes for this Five episode. episodes. <laughs> Wait, excuse me. <laughs> We're going to watch five episodes. Hell yes. We're going to watch from season one, View from a Villa. And name, date, and place. Mm -hmm. From season three, we're going to watch the episode, Are You Going to Be More Permanent? Mm -hmm. And we're going to watch all of season four, which is two episodes, but they're both on the longer side. Hiroshi and Shindashima, Mm -hmm. which would have been what immediately preceded the production on The Prisoner. Yeah, we'll talk more about why these specific episodes and why not some other episodes that you might have been thinking about uh, Mm -hmm. when we actually get to that episode recording. Believe you me, there's a lot of episodes to watch because they made a lot of Danger Man. It's true. Hey, Brennan here in the edit to mention that if you're listening to this episode when it comes out, the Danger Man episode will be out next week. And we'll be back in two weeks with our next episode of The Prisoner, where we will be watching The Schizoid Man.
the schizoid man, the schizoid man, as the next episode is part of the ITC watch order. If you're not listening to this episode when it comes out, then I'm a dream. I'm a figment of your imagination. You've been brainwashed. Whoa. Carly, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a treat to have you here. No problem. It was a good time. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to plug where people can find you on the internet? Do you have any uh, anything that you want to share? You don't have to. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I still have a main account on Twitter, which is uh, Zusty, Z-U-S-T-Y. I don't really go on there. So, like, Wise. whatever, that's your business. Uh, Blue Sky is the same, uh, which I do go on there more. Um, mm mm-hmm. Uh, making video games over here at Sonderlust Studios, which is a place that I work at. Mm-hmm. That's uh, all I can think of at this time. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> Excellent. Matthew, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me for my sins still on Twitter at no. Matthew Guz. <laughs> and Brendan, where can they find you? You can find me at underscore Sulcata basically everywhere except for Blue Sky. What? Yeah. You can actually, you know what? You can find my new blog. Whoa. <gasps> I started a blog. You can find me at Brendan McLeod.dev. Hell yeah. That's very exciting. Yeah. A lot of people in the wake of co-hosts demise started mm-hmm. blogs and got back into the RSS lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Our art was created by Cy F. Sweetman. You can find more of his work at CyFSweetman.card.co. Our theme song is by Devin Nelson. Find their work at devindecibel.bandcamp.com. Matthew. Yeah. Thanks for seeing me. <laughs> Hold on. I can't do with a response to that. You, <laughs> you rude man. Um, no, 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 no. Brendan. Be seeing you. Not if I see you first. Mm-hmm.